YouTube, uh, YouTube live feed for the meeting. People registering to be uh, an attendee must use their names, otherwise they will not be allowed to participate in discussion. Attendees will join in listening mode. They can then click to raise their hand or click the, the raise hand button if they wish to speak. The chair will call on those who have raised their hands in the order they were raised. All questions should be directed through the chair. Um, meeting materials, all supporting materials that have been provided. Members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda um, unless the chair notes otherwise. So what we did last week is if I took any public comment or public comment on an agenda item, I'm usually, uh, we started uh, those in the room we go to first and then we go to those online. That seemed to work out. We're gonna just go with that policy for now. Okay, over to county, Don. Good evening. I will call the July 21st County Commissioner's meeting to order. Um, announcements, the County Commissioner meeting is being video and audio recorded. Are there any public comments on county for something that's otherwise not on our agenda for discussion? Okay, seeing none, um, there's no new business that I'm aware of. It, are there any changes to the minutes? Move approval. Is there a mm -hmm. second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Almost Aye. said by roll call. <laughs> Thank you. Um, approval of payroll and treasury warrants. Move approval. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, and county commissioner's um, appointment for the Nantica Planning and Economic Development Commission. I believe that that's Christy. Do we need a motion? Or? Appoint Christy. Second. Second. Awesome. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Nicely done, Don. That was fast. Okay, we'll call the order of the July 21st select board meeting to order. Uh, there's no changes to the agenda that I know of. Um, is there anything moved, Libby, that's not already on the agenda? The just public the hearing, but it says there in the. Yep. Um, we ha we just have one additional announcement that was the sewer director will make. Okay. All right. So over to you for announcements. Thank you. This meeting is being video and audio recorded as noted. Um, we have a special recognition tonight of a retiring certified nursing assistant, Sherry Souza. She is retiring from our island home with 30 years of service. She could not unfortunately be here with us tonight. So Michelle Monroe, the assistant administrator from our island home is here to accept a plaque that we have um, obtained. So that it looks like um, uh, on Sherry's behalf. Do you wanna come up Michelle, please? And we will get this to Sherry and we very much appreciate her service. Her compassion towards residents is greatly appreciated and much uh, respected and admired. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. The next board meeting will take place on August 4th at 5.30 p.m. This is the summer schedule. We've added to the announcements when the current vaccine clinics are and where they are taking place. They are um, currently on first way at the school administration site on Thursdays from 4.30 to 6.30, Sundays from 12 to noon, sorry, 12 to noon, from 12 noon to 2 p.m. And there's a link to the full schedule on, on the town website. And I may, some of you may have your own um, board announcements or comments. Thank you, Libby. Uh, we put this on the agenda for us. Uh, a lot of times, uh, select board members have comments, um, could be positive or just observations, but come 9, 9.30, we don't give them because we want to get out of here. So I, I, I move this to the this agenda here announcements for just quick things. I'll start off with with one, just a little bit of a follow up. But the CAFR, there was some discussions on the language of that. It looked like a, a certain policy for growth. I just wanted to clarify that that language has been in the CAFR for seven years, and it's normally uh, the CAFR is a. I think Libby, you explained to me that's um, pretty much a note or memo document 
from the finance director to you. It's not endorsed by the select board. And that same language has been there for seven years. So what are we doing about it? Um, we're going to look at that language, the finance committee chair. We've talked to Denise Cronow and um, this in the fall, uh, in the winter, this next round of the CAFR, have the, the finance committee work with the finance director to look at that language and possibly make some edits or add adaptations. So that was just a, uh, one quick thing. And the other one is the capital program committee and the, the capital process in general has, um, we met, what was it, two weeks ago, Don, when you were the chair? We met with the, the finance committee vice chair and chair uh, Don and I were there, town administration, the finance uh, department, and um, Stephen Welch from Capcom. And just to get the capital process started, we usually don't do that till the end of August. So we're pretty much six weeks ahead. Um, and we're getting close to having a, 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 a realistic, as much as you can, a 10-year plan in capital. And a lot of that work has uh, been pushed by Stephen Welch. I want to thank him. And Rick Sears, our assistant finance director. He's really hitting his stride. And I'm really excited about capital, that whole process this year. Any other comments or announcements? From this audience? Okay. Uh, I, got, I guess I have a couple. I don't know. I asked you earlier where to do it. Yeah. We had a, re we had a request from uh, uh, Bruce Mandel to put a letter to DEP for more testing. Uh, and that was for the DEP testing uh, sampling for PFAS. And he sort of got a bit of a runaround. He sent it all to us about you know who will write the letter and I would like the board to you know direct the letter be sent by Friday if we could. So I think it's important and if we could get a few more testing that's better than the you know 40 or 60 that are already lined up. Thank you Matt. We'll I'll send an email um Libby and I are talking about that today. Anything else? <clears throat> One more. Okay. Cliff uh last year we, we've had issues up on Cliff Road, I forwarded this to you guys too, but just so everyone know. Uh, there's with beach fires uh, on Steps Beach along that area, some of the neighbors have had issues. There were some that called me and they were going to close their beaches last year. And we talked them into, please don't do that. That's not the Nantucket way. And they didn't, but they're having issues again. And so I brought it to the attention of Libby and uh, Jason today. And we'll see, hopefully we'll get a little, get it addressed and sort of take care of that and be proactive rather than get into another situation with closed beaches, so. Thank you, Matt. This, uh, this next one is mine, correct? Let me the committee appointments. Yeah. Let me find this here. Bear with me here. There we go. Okay, for um, so we will be uh, voting on some of the, these seats August 18th. Uh, we're just going to run through them. Agricultural Commission, there's four seats available, no applicants. So somebody's looking for something to do, and that's part of your uh, core values. Let's, let's get some people on Agricultural Commission. Council for Human Services, there's one seat available and eight applicants. Sure. Uh, applicants are Athlon Sweeney, Kelly Stephan, Ruth Tonico, Sally Ann Austin, Janet Forrest, Colin Ferguson, Veronica Olkick, and Jordan Leiden. Yes. My understanding is that is a is that a bylaw change, so it needs to be approved still by the AG. So until that happens, those seats aren't available. So after this vote, there could be two more seats available at a later time this year. Okay, good for the applicants to know. Cultural Council, we have two seats available and four applicants. Those applicants are Ava Rollins, Philip Santarelli, Sarah Ellis, and Kathy Melrod. I apologize if I'm messing up anybody's names. And took a historical commission alternate. There's one seat available and five applicants, Susan Locke, Linda Williams, Ethan Griffin, 
Barbara Ann White and Jerry Ferguson. Planning board alternative, one seat available, three applicants. Those applicants are David Callahan, Chad Alexander Kilvert, the fourth, and Abigail Camp, Abby Camp. Roads and right of way committee, there's one seat available and no applicants. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Yes. I will note that we received a late application for that. So I'm going to have to hold that over till our next round. Yes. Okay. Tree advisory committee, one seat available, two applicants. This is great because um, that was, there was no applicants when we went through this last time. So it's Ben Shampoo and Stephen Williams. So thank you to all the applicants. Oops, sorry. Is there one more? Did I miss it? Oh, thank you. Uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals, one seat available, three applicants, Alyssa Allen, uh, Abby Olina, David Pumphrey. Zoning Board of Appeals alternate, we have two applicants, one seat available, two applicants, and that's Jeff Thayer and David Pumphrey. And just to note, David Pumphrey is, he's put his name in obviously for both seats, so if you want one of them, one if you want to consider the other. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank the much uh, gratitude to all the applicants for putting their names in. And I believe that's it. Again, that's August 18th. We'll be voting on those. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so there's two, actually, there's two other announcements. I forgot to mention that Human Services Director Jericho Mealy is going to come on remotely and give, um, hopefully he's on there, and give an update on some COVID issues. But in the meantime, Sewer Director David Gray has um, an important public service announcement. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. I just wanted to get it out to the public that um, about the no wipes in the pipes and um, grease, uh, et cetera. We've having a, a huge run this year on wipes and paper towels. Uh, we're removing probably about two and a half tons a week right now of um, wipes and other stuff that's being disposed down the, the toilets, uh, as well as grease. Um, still, another thing out of COVID that's happened is there's more grease around the island than just by the restaurants because people are staying home and cooking. So we're seeing a large, large increase in the in grease, but the wipes and the paper towels are really bad this summer so far. So I just wanted to get that out there again. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thanks I, very much, David. I can attest to, uh, I think I've had two tours of your facility, David, at the wastewater treatment facility. And when he shows you what it does to all their mechanisms and their processes, like you know, even I learned, like I don't even put Kleenex down the toilet. Like you taught me that. Like there's only one thing, a couple things go down there, right? Not even Kleenex. So um, it, it definitely, it hurts their process. Thank you, David. Thank you very much, David. Um, is, were we able to get Jericho going? Oh, there he is, yep. Okay, so uh, Jerrica and I spoke, um, communicated earlier today. Um, there are some spikes in positive COVID cases in areas on the Cape and the vineyard. And I think there might've even been a, was there a release that went out from health department today? We have uh, a, released a mask advisory, um, which is a strong recommendation for all individuals to be masked up if they're indoors in public with anyone else. And if they are outdoors and cannot maintain six foot distancing from other people, so parks, um, open air, uh, seeing if you're not six feet away from people that are in your pod, um, your exposure group in that case. Um, we've seen a couple of spikes both in Provincetown and in um, Martha's Vineyard. Uh, all of those have been associated specific with specific events and have been um, spreader events more or less that label clusters by the state. Um, we're monitoring those and we're participating in state contact tracing. Um, and there have been additional travel-based um, Positives confirmed later for people who have traveled through Nantucket during the exposure area, yes. Um, right now, we're tracking um, a few cases, though we're still, uh, I believe, five uh, positive cases sampled on the island since the, uh, I believe it's the 16th. Um, so we're, we're doing fairly well for community spread, um, but we are definitely seeing um, uh, exposures from off island. Um, one of the things that we're working on now is being a little um, more information forward with the wastewater surveillance system. Um, it's worth noting that all of these travel cases uh, are not detectable by local testing, regardless of the type. Um, so that's why we're sort of relying primarily on the wastewater uh, surveillance system, um, because that gives us basically the, 
the best signal to noise ratio in terms of determining whether there's uh, community spread on the island. Um, additionally, we're ready to ramp up um, the vaccination clinics that we've been offering. Um, as Libby mentioned earlier, those are on Thursday, 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. and Sunday. Uh, 12 to 2. We've got them scheduled out through the end of July, and we'll be adding the August schedule shortly once we get a, um, a measure of the demand. Um, we don't intend to scale back on those much through the month of August um, at all, so there should be plenty of uh, opportunities for people to get vaccinated if they haven't, if they're still um, hanging a single dose, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we're also keeping an eye on the Delta variant. Um, it is right now accounting nationwide for over a majority of the new cases. It's significantly more virulent. That is, it's, it spreads quicker and easier, um, both than heirloom COVID um, or the wild type that was the original COVID, and then all of the variants with uh, increased transmission rates. Uh, this is the fastest spreading one. It also seems to present um, stiffer uh, symptoms in unvaccinated individuals, and it's responsible for the majority of current fatalities uh, among unvaccinated people from COVID in the US. Um, we don't have uh, fully sequenced samples returned um, from the island confirming that they that is a Delta variant, but it is a very safe bet that if uh, that most, if not all, new COVID cases are going to be Delta very shortly if they are not already. Um, and we are working with BioBot to um, have their variant testing system uh, added to our wastewater surveillance system, so that we'll be able to get a good figure on what type of variants we had uh, on the island. Um, I believe that covers most of the main questions. If anyone has any questions, oh, I'm sorry, there's one other thing, is if we do have a spike on the wastewater surveillance system, that'll show up about a week before the people will be coming, will be becoming symptomatic. So in that, in terms of, I've already reached out to state uh, on the possibility of having mobile testing centers stood up on the island in order to increase that um, testing throughput if necessary. Um, but uh, if the balance is between testing not terribly well and giving us a false sense of security versus maximizing the amount of vaccinations we should do, um, the vaccine is always a better solution as that will prevent the actual, you know, we want to get people vaccinated um, and not rely on um, the sort of testing, which is not necessarily the best signal to, like I said, signal to noise ratio with the lower testing numbers. Have a question, Jason? Yep, go ahead. Yeah, Jericho, can, uh, are masks still required on public transportation, like the boats, the airplanes, buses, et cetera? Absolutely. The one place where the state's mask mandate is still required is on all forms of public transportation, be it taxis onto steamships, onto whatever. Um, uh, their, their travel time is probably the, the, the highest exposure risk most people will have in this weather. Um, and uh, masks are, are still mandatory in public transportation. Well, a follow-up, I have a suggestion. Uh, the steamship is doing a really good job. They are uh, making sure they hand out masks and they're requiring them. Uh, Highline is not, and you almost feel guilty if you have a mask on. So I would request that we send them a reminder or the health department send them a reminder, especially with this, uh, the Delta variant and people you know, are getting sick that have been vaccinated. They aren't getting very sick, but they're able to transmit they believe. And so I just think, you know, people shouldn't be uh, jeopardizing themselves to come to Nantucket. If that's the rule, it should be enforced. I, I absolutely agree. And um, I'm looking into, uh, I've had a couple of reports along those lines as well. And I'm uh, going to be reaching out to the High Line uh, about the importance of, of maintaining that mask mandate on public transportation. Any other comments, questions for Jericho? Thank you, Jericho. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, do you Anyone? want me to? Uh, no, I'm okay. sorry. That's it for, yep, sorry. So this next agenda item is a follow-up on select board and, and public comments from previous meetings. Um, Libby, do you want to walk us through a couple 
road work line painting? Sure. So at last week's meeting, there were a couple of public comments uh, that were appropriate for follow up. One had to do with what roads are going to be included in the appropriation approved at the 2021 annual town meeting for road work. That is under review by staff. So we will have to get back to the board on that. It will relate to the pavement management plan that we have uh, that prioritizes the various roads in terms of their condition. The next comment had to do with line painting. Why hasn't line painting occurred this year? Um, we had, as we were trying to let people know earlier in the year to lower expectations about things that happen normally that are delayed because of COVID. And this was one of them. The line painting contractor was unable to get a boat reservation until September. And it was determined that it would probably be better just to do the line painting. And this is sidelines and center lines in uh, the spring of 2022, because if we did it in the fall or early winter with plowing and sanding, it'll get rubbed off and um, degraded quicker. So that was something I discussed with the chair and vice chair at the time. And the next item had to do with, is there a legal opinion with respect to a memo recently sent by the select board to the conservation commission? There is not a legal opinion and there was not uh, a need for a legal opinion was not um, um, expressed because there's no legal reason why the select board cannot send a request memo to any other board committee or commission. So that discussion happened in the presence of council and um, it is no legal opinion needed. Thank you, Libby. And, and, and it was a misunderstanding from someone how they, how they were reading. It was on the, uh, on the website, on the Daily Nantucket or something. And right. they read our, you know, the minutes and got a, they misunderstood what it was saying. Mm -hmm. So it was an honest misunderstanding. It wasn't a, you know, that's what, how it got out into the public and it was incorrect. Okay. Thank you. We're gonna move on to public comment. Is there anyone here that like to speak on something that's not on our agenda? Yep, please just come over here to the microphone, state your name. Uh, good afternoon, it's, uh, my name is George Smith. My wife is here with me, June. Uh, we've been trying very hard to get our permits in place for sewer on Pulpus Road. And we're having a very difficult time with the engineers and surveys to line them up. I'm asking for some possibility of a slight extension in order to do that. Thank you, George. On public comment, we can't discuss anything, but we will, we can, we'll, we're taking notes and we'll get back to you. Thank you that. very much. We, yeah, we can't make a decision on a public comment. Thank you, George. Quick. Sure. Um, that's actually the second or third person that's brought this to my attention with everybody being backed up. So I think it's worth having a discussion about at a future agenda. Sure, we can get recommendations from sewer department and town, town staff. This is more of a board of health issue and oh, we, yeah. um, we can get an sure. update from the director. Okay. Thank you, Libby. Any other public comment that's not on the agenda? Okay, there's no new business that I know of. <laughs> You Don? got two public. You got two. Oh, sorry, I didn't even have that looking. raised. Sorry. Thank you. Vice chair is supposed to be on top of that. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Sorry, I didn't even have that up on my screen. Okay, can we go to uh, Thomas. Uh, yep, I just let him in. Okay, thanks. Uh, yes, uh, Chairman uh, uh, Thomas Barrett of 14 Tosh Lane. Um, I made the comments in regard to the line painting. Um, I understand that we can't do the uh, center lines and, and uh, sidelines until spring. However, some of the sidewalk uh, crossings are definitely in need of it. Um, a lot of people don't know that there's crossings when they're driving because we have so many visitors and I've seen a few incidences that um, could have been tragic. Um, that's one thing I want to make comment. And the other comment I wanted to make was I brought to the attention of the DPW back in June and uh, brought it back again just today in regard to uh, trimming back the corner of uh, vines on Walwinnett Road. Um, I head out to Walwinnett quite often, and there's a lot of cars that are coming around the corner. 
that are going into the other lane because they don't want to hit the vines that, and sticks that are growing into the side there. And I got a reply from the town in regard to that some equipment's broken or something like that, but that really needs to be addressed in a, in a, in a very short term period. Um, definitely before um, next board of select or uh, select board meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berta. Go to the next one, Sarah Ellis. Yes, thank you for taking my comment. Um, I just wanted to second what Mr. Barada had to say regarding the, the crosswalks. Um, I live right near Five Corners and there's really only one, which I think is the one coming from, um, anyway, there's only one that's really existing anymore and the rest are virtually invisible. Uh, that isn't a problem for those of us that live here year round because we have an expectation of crossing there or people crossing there. But it seems particularly dangerous this summer and I wouldn't want something to happen in the town to be at fault. Thank you, Sarah. Any other comment that's not on the agenda? Move on to approval minutes, warrants, and pending contracts. We had a motion to approve uh, the minutes and treasury warrants. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That motion carries unanimously. Approval of pending contracts. Is there any questions from the board? Oh, may I make one? I uh, sure. forgot to mention this. The NCTV contract for the PEG channel is actually premature, and we will bring that back at a later time. Okay. okay. I'll make a motion to approve. The removal of the NCTV contract. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That motion carries unanimously. On to consent items, resignation, acceptance of the Cannabis Advisory Committee. Motion to accept and write a letter of thanks. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That motion carries unanimously. On to citizen department request, housing director, request for approval of updated housing production plan. Mr. Tucker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Board. Uh, Tucker Holland, Housing Director. Um, just this is a brief intro. We have uh, Judy Barrett here with us tonight who will be um, going through the plan with you all. Uh, as you all will recall, every municipality is required to update their housing production plan every five years. Ours was last approved in October of 2016 by the Department of Housing and Community Development. So the uh, Affordable Housing Trust and a lot of other folks have been uh, working hard on updating the plan uh, with Judy and her partner in this, Jen Goldson. We feel very fortunate to have basically the two leading uh, consultants on this topic in the state working with us. And um, we have had an extensive public outreach during the course of this program. Over 1,200, excuse me, almost 1,200 surveys were filled out. 10% of those actually were filled out in both Spanish and Portuguese. Um, we have had over 40 uh, community leaders, if you will, of a wide variety of voices uh, take, partake in a series of focus groups uh, in February, which lasted one to two hours each. And then there have been numerous public meetings, including two webinars, which were live televised and um, had strong public participation. So we, we feel this is a document that uh, has received a lot of input and it has been approved by the Affordable Housing Trust, as well as the planning board at their July 12th meeting. Uh, the discussion with you all tonight is really the last stop before it would be sent on to the state for, for their approval. And with that, I'll turn it over to Judy. Thank you. So good evening. Um, it's always nice to be back in Nantucket. I had the privilege of working on the housing production plan that was approved in 2016 um, and was delighted to be uh, you know, hired to, to come back uh, and work with you um, and Jen on this plan. I prepared a couple of slides just because I thought it would be the most organized way to, to go through this. So if the board doesn't object, I'm going to screen share those now. All 
Are you able to see those slides? Yes, Judy. Super, thank you. Oops, doesn't seem to want to advance. There we go. Um, so the consulting team, as Tucker mentioned, uh, included uh, my firm, basically me and um, one of my staff, Tyler Marin, who did the vast majority of the work on this project. Um, and I have a lot of gratitude to him for how hard he worked on this, including through multiple drafts based on comments received. Um, my colleague, Jen Goldson, also participated on the team um, as mainly the one kind of organizing the community engagement process. And her colleague, uh, Barry Fradkin, did most of the maps. Uh, we produced some and Jen's shop produced some. Uh, we met a few, several times uh, with the Housing Trust and, and worked closely with Tucker and took uh, direction from them. Uh, and based on comments we received from them, uh, as well as Andrew Vorse. Um, as I said, this, pro this document went through, I don't know, four or five revisions before it got to the point where I think we were all comfortable submitting it to you for approval to submit to the state. Um, I do want to point out that uh, Andrew spent a significant amount of time with us on the identification of municipal and privately owned sites that might make sense for affordable housing. And we deeply appreciated uh, all that input uh, as well, of course, as, as, as Tucker's and, and that of the Housing Trust. So I wanna just lay out for you a bit a lot how the public process worked, um, what the housing needs assessment uh, is comprised of, uh, what the housing goals are about, and then the strategies and the action plan. And when I get to the end of this, I'll talk about next steps and then you know, happy to field any questions from the select board. So just to be clear, I know that this may be old hat for many of you, but I felt compelled to kind of review this in case we have viewers who are not familiar with the housing production plan. Uh, it's a plan that Nantucket has been operating under and has implemented uh, over the past five years uh, and successfully implemented, I might add, which is why you recently received uh, a second period of housing plan certification from DHCD. So it is a state recognized plan that looks at housing needs in the community uh, and of course uh, in other parts of the Commonwealth, certainly at the regional level and how your community wants to create more a diverse housing stock, including affordability. It is also a strategy to work toward the 10% statutory minimum under chapter 40B and to stay there. Um, and then it is a strategy to address affordable housing needs of people who live and work uh, in the community. Um, to be clear, a lot of misinformation out there or misunderstanding, I think, about Chapter 40B, it's actually the regional planning law. Um, and, uh, and the comprehensive permit law, which is what really is the focus of this, this plan, um, is just a piece of the regional planning law. And the reason it's in the regional planning law is that, um, that housing is kind of a regional issue in Massachusetts. Um, and so rather than some communities carrying an unfair burden for meeting housing needs, uh, everyone is expected to do their part, uh, including Nantucket. Um, and that standard for having done your part uh, is the 10% statutory minimum. To be clear, that 10% is based on the most recent decennial census year round housing count. So uh, we're all waiting to see what happens when the census 2020 counts come out as to where Nantucket will be, but based on current regulations and policies, you're currently at 5.58%. Um, your SHI recent subsidized housing inventory, excuse, uh, excuse me, recently went up to 273 units. So, you know, you've made progress certainly since the last time I worked on a plan um, with Nantucket. And it's, it's impressive to come back to the community that you've worked with before and see what has changed. When we talk about affordable housing in a housing production plan, we are talking mainly about the, the lower moderate income housing that counts under chapter 40B. That doesn't mean that the plan ignores other housing needs, it doesn't. Um, your, your town clearly has a wider range of needs and you recognize that in your zoning as well um, by uh, acknowledging the existence of needs for housing up to 150% of area median income. Uh, it's housing that is both affordable to households based on their household size and income, but also suitable for the size of the household and is protected by a long-term deed restriction so that the unit stays affordable over time as it's resold or re-rented. 
Community engagement was a big piece of this project. Um, in many ways, I think a larger part than the last plan and that made it, I think, a stronger plan. Um, the engagement process uh, that was mainly organized by my friend Jen included uh, group interviews, uh, a community survey, two webinars, and of course we met several times with the housing trust as well. So we all kind of participated in that, but the kind of overall design of the community engagement process up to and through the last webinar uh, was handled by Jen. And she has now finished her work on the project, but of course we're still working on it with you to get, to get this through the finish line. At uh, the heart of any housing plan, whether it's a chapter 40B plan or any other housing plan is a needs assessment, which looks at um, you know, what are the housing needs in your community um, and, uh, and at what sort of income tiers do those exist? What are the constraints that are operating kind of against the provision of affordable housing? Uh, and so we look at a variety of information sources to draw conclusions about needs. Certainly the community engagement process played a major part in this. Um, many of the questions that were asked in the webinars, the focus groups, uh, and on the survey had to do precisely with needs in the community. We also look to the Census Bureau. I know that the Census Bureau is probably not the best source for Nantucket. Um, the reality, however, is that because Chapter 40B is so wedded to the decennial census, um, that the expectation of DHCD is that communities will use what's called the American Community Survey to develop a demographic uh, projection, you know, projections and summary of the community and understand the housing profile as well. And so we did that, but of course, clearly in the introduction to the plan, we also point out that there are issues and limitations with the census data, but it's kind of what you use in this kind of plan to describe uh, the statistical elements of need. It certainly isn't the be all and end all source for this plan or any other plan, but it is something we look at. We looked at public school data, both from the school department as well as the Commonwealth. Um, some of the information we use comes from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. They are a particularly rich source of information for, the, um, for housing affordability for people who are uh, lower income households. Uh, and then we also looked at market data to the extent that it's available, both from um, two outside sources called Rentometer and Reonomy, which kind of give you insights into sales of different types of, of structures, residential structures. Uh, Rentometer is a good source for market rentals, but there's really, in Nantucket, there's no better source than local information. Um, Fisher Real Estate had also produced a kind of market overview that we, were, we had the advantage to looking at. And then, of course, there were other sources as well, but these are kind of the main ones that we look at. And we relied um, heavily and successfully on input from town staff who just provided an enormous amount of data to us as we worked on this project. Um, there are potential challenges for housing uh, in your community and every other community I've ever worked in. Um, and so part of the needs assessment is not only kind of what are the housing needs in the community, but what are the needs that the community needs to try to address in order to overcome um, the, the, the shortage of affordable housing. And some of these things are in your control and some are not. Um, and that's true for every community I've ever worked in as well. So, you know, the fact that you're a higher income uh, area is sort of in some ways uh, ex uh, exacerbates the needs for lower income people, especially your hospitality workers and others. There are seasonal market pressures that are really dramatic uh, in Nantucket. It looks to us, and I think what we've kind of picked up from local lore as well, is that it looks as though the seasonal market is really kind of seizing what had been sort of historically year round housing. Uh, and so the seasonal market's kind of taken over in terms of the drive for housing production. And that is a further challenge for the creation of affordability. Uh, there are regulatory challenges in every community as well. Uh, zoning to some extent uh, is a constraint in Nantucket. It's also a tremendous opportunity. You've probably done more innovative things with your zoning than a lot of communities I've worked in, uh, in terms of trying to create more housing supply as well as to create affordability not only as chapter 40B defines affordability, but also in, in your own kind of lived experience as Nantucket residents. Um, conservation standards are high as they should be. Um, you have a number of resource areas that are very significant. Uh, you have also a historic district kind of town-wide. 
And those things are not necessarily bad. They're just kind of things that, that to help to drive the, um, uh, the, the process, if you will, for creating affordable housing. Um, you have a unique geography. You have, of course, environmental concerns. Um, you don't have unlimited transportation or infrastructure resources. Uh, you know, in addition, I would just say you don't have neighbors next door who can help to shoulder some of the need in your community, just as you would be shouldering need in their community. And that is the thing that makes Nantucket different from every town uh, that we work in, is that you don't have, your, your region, if you will, is actually you. Um, and so that, that itself is kind of an interesting constraint um, and one that has to be addressed. The other thing that's a challenge for housing uh, is community opposition. And I'm always kind of careful when I talk about this because people who have concerns about housing development often have uh, perfectly valid concerns. There are objections that need to be addressed. Uh, and then there are objections that just are just not appropriate. And so the whole challenge for housing development is kind of trying to address where you can the things that are legitimate concerns um, that I think, frankly, Nantucket does a great job already trying to address, but then also to recognize that, um, that opposition uh, on the basis of um, you know, issues that really kind of bump up against the Federal Fair Housing Act and other things are just, they're just not appropriate. And so sometimes those seem a bit pronounced in Nantucket, and we certainly picked up on that uh, in the community survey. So these are all challenges we kind of saw uh, on Nantucket to varying degrees. Um, there are strategies and an action plan in every, uh, in every housing plan, and this is, you know, no different. Uh, we talk about the need for reliable funding streams. I know Antec has been dealing with this for a long time, trying to get special legislation passed to deal in a more permanent way with where is money coming from to deal with the affordable housing crisis. Um, public education and outreach, I think, will continue to be a challenge in your community, um, just based on information that we picked up in the focus groups and uh, in the survey as well, and just comments that have come to us. I think there's a lot of public education need that still needs to be met. It's not that you haven't been doing anything. You just need to keep doing it. Um, identify you know, potential municipally owned sites that could be made available for housing development. On this point and the next one, Andrew was really instrumental, Tucker was instrumental in helping us identify locations in the plan, um, many of which are actually profiled in the plan, um, both in terms of just a picture of the site and a map of it and a bit of a description about you know, what probably could be done, either through your existing zoning or through some type of a, quote, friendly comprehensive permit. Um, I think this plan goes uh, way, way beyond what many housing production plans do to try to be very clear about, yeah, we have opportunities, we have limitations, but we also have some opportunities and these are things that we could do. And here are specific ways that we can do it. And I would just point out that that's actually a requirement of DHCD is that towns name places and name zoning districts where things could be changed. I, I think Nantucket's done a very good job of that and a very clear job. The plan is, is um, there's no ambiguity in it. Um, you know, expanding existing zoning tools where it makes sense to do, to do so. I think, again, Dan Tuck has done a good job of always sort of being vigilant about where are things that we could tweak in our zoning to create more affordability. Um, and also recognizing, however, that strategies will differ across the island. And the fact that some areas have infrastructure and some don't doesn't mean that there are some areas of the town where affordability just shouldn't even be touched, because that's not really true. That also is a fair housing issue. So recognizing that in some parts of the island where the utilities really are limited or non-existent, it may take deeper subsidy to make affordability happen, make, make a different type of deal, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing it. Whereas areas that do have utilities and infrastructure, uh, as in any community, would be the most obvious places to be looking to, to create affordability, um, which by definition almost always requires a higher density or intensity of use of development. Um, expanding rental opportunities will continue to be a real need and a challenge. And I know uh, both for this and as well as home ownership, there's an ongoing concern about making sure that there's year round housing in the mix, whether affordable or not, um, but just making sure that, that we have both affordable housing and then housing for people who are trying to live and work here on a year round basis which unfortunately, you know, zoning doesn't fix, but it's something to be very aware of. 
Um, developing a needs assessment for disability housing. We, we kind of poked at this a bit and realized that many people kind of thought there's a need, but they couldn't really quite describe it. Um, it's hard for me to imagine any community that doesn't have disability housing needs um, just because we see it everywhere. And I don't think Nantucket's any exception, but it's a little bit hard to articulate the extent of that need or the type of disability housing that's required. People often think of disability housing as wheelchair access, but it's actually a much bigger concept than that. So we think it would be good for the housing trust to invest uh, in a needs assessment and get a better handle on that, which might be addressed in a subsequent you know, housing plan if, if necessary. We also suggested that the island look at creating a community land trust. And I know people are probably tired of hearing about housing groups because you have several, but a community land trust has a specific function. I know Tucker's very familiar with the one that's um, on the vineyard. And I think one of the things a land trust would make sense for that really your housing trust is somewhat hampered to do, a community land trust is not subject to the municipal procurement law. It is a private entity. So it can be a bit more nimble um, it can be the development entity and your, your municipal affordable housing trust can be the bank. So there are ways to kind of think about how all these tools come together to do what you need done. And we think that needs to be looked at. We actually had suggested this in the last housing plan. And I, I kind of feel like that recommendation needs to be kept alive. Um, and then to sort of continue regional collaboration, which you know, might make some people chuckle, but I know uh, Tucker has an active relationship with uh, um, and co collaboration with the um, the, the community land trust uh, in, on the vineyard. I know there's been interaction with the Cape and Islands um, housing, housing people, um, you know, who also been involved in developing housing uh, on, on Nantucket. So those things need to all kind of continue. But this is sort of the heart of the action plan that's it's in this housing production plan. The next steps for the, for the island are for, we're hoping that you will vote to approve the plan. I know we have collected some comments on it along the way. I think Tucker's done a good job keeping a record of what those are. We've just not made any more changes since the most recent version because at some point it just gets, you know, get too many versions of a document out there. But we know there are a few comments we need to address. Um, we will do that, uh, but in whatever form subject to, you know, incorporation of, of comments from the select board and others to approve the plan is really sort of the critical next step. Um, you may remember, because um, I know uh, Libby worked on this the last time, there is a transmittal letter that needs to be prepared for DHCD. We typically write that for you. Um, you folks need to sign it. We take the transmittal letter, we take the housing production plan, we submit it to DHCD. They have up to 90 days to review the plan. Last time they were like lightning speed. I don't know if that will be the case this time, um, not because I think there's anything wrong with the plan. But because they're just, it, I don't think it's as easy for them to work efficiently sometimes now because they're still not back in the office and probably never will be in the way that they were before. Um, but they have 90 days and they've typically been very good about approving plans, both for Jen and, and me. We've just not had any trouble. So I would anticipate that this one as well would be approved. Uh, and that's really kind of where we are right now and why we're in front of you. The planning board last week considered it and took a vote um, to support the plan. That was one step that was needed. Now, I think it's with the select board. So that's kind of an overview of where we are and what we've done and I'm happy to field any questions or, you know, Tucker, maybe the more appropriate person to answer some questions, but I'm here as well. Thank you, Judy. Before we go to a motion, any questions, comments from the board? Tucker, anything you'd like to? I, I, well, I want to uh, thank Judy and Jen and their teams again. Um, the, the comments that we have received from the uh, trust approval process and the planning board approval process are, are, are minimal. So that, you know, the changes are really technical, um, nothing really um, material to mention. I'll, I'll simply mention, in addition to making those few minor edits, uh, the final plan will be punctuated with more visuals, photos, graphics, okay. yeah. so it, just so folks know. I forgot to mention that, Tucker. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tucker. Thank you, Judy. And I'll make a quick comment. I, I, I've read a few of these now, and we are, you know, it's improving and we're getting better. And I think uh, sort of the emphasis on the zoning and on the, you know, sort of land trust and other issues that we've talked about for years are kind of coming up, bubbling up and becoming 
uh, priorities, and I think that's you know appropriate. They need to. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. Don. I would just say I, I do really like the component of starting to talk more significantly about um, housing for people with all sorts of different di disabilities, excuse me. So that's really appropriate. Okay. Thank you, Don. If there's no more comments, is there a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Tucker. Thank you, Judy. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Do you need me to stay on for any reason? I think that I think we're okay. I think that's okay. It. Have a good meeting. Judy, and thanks for the Bye -bye. trust. Okay, next up, we have a request for approval and execution of a quick claim deed for to grant the following to Richmond Great Point Development. Ken's going to take us through this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is fairly straightforward. This uh, transaction has a good history behind it. It was first approved at town meeting in 2017. It was then the subject of the memorandum of understanding with Richmond. And it, it is the last of the three lots that were involved in this that needed to go through the land court. And this is the last one to come out. Uh, the documentation has been approved by the land court it's been approved by town council. And so it's staff and town council's recommendation that you move forward and execute the deed that is included as part of your package. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Any questions for Ken? Yeah, move okay. approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna move on to public hearings. Uh, this uh, the first one is you see in the, the agenda item request to continue to August 18th. So the next one is a public. You need a motion. To oh, sorry. May I have a motion to. So moved. Continue? Second. All those in favor. Aye. 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 That motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Erica. Keeping us on the ball. Next one is a public hearing to consider application for a new mobile food unit for is it Yezi? Yezi's. Uh, Loring Ave LLC DBA Yezzy's on Nantucket, located at 57 Old South Road, Theodore Fossa Manager. I'm going to recuse just in case. Okay. Okay. Hi, Thank you. Okay. Mobile food application, as you mentioned, for Yezzy's uh, Loring Ave LLC DBA Yezzy's, and I hope I'm saying that right. Um, on Nantucket, mobile food unit application. Um, they are currently running the three scoops location on Old South Road, uh, which will be their location for the kitchen there. And they will um, be servicing um, at the Richmond property there at 67 Old South Road. Um, we have property approval for that um, currently. Their plan review has been approved by the health department. So they're all set there. They will have to go for uh, final inspections. Um, with the health department, as David Gray mentioned to me, their sewer permit too as well, um, and all that. So there's no objections to this application. Currently, they are only uh, requesting to serve at that one location. Um, as we mentioned in all these applications, any other locations will need property owner approval, um, and there's no service in the downtown uh, historic district um, or any property without property owner approval. Any questions? No, uh, I want to make sure that I opened the public hearing. I don't know if I said I opened it or not, but um, is this a public hearing? Are there any questions from the board or the public here? Comments? I don't see anything online. Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Pleasure of the board. Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 4 0. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Matt, you can come back now. Okay, select board's reports comments. Our first one up is a discussion regarding the continuation of outdoor dining. Uh, before we get started, yeah, I guess Amy, you're coming right back. Um, I just wanted to say, I'd like to allocate us a good portion tonight, whether it's 45 minutes or an hour to have a, a good discussion on this. Uh, I just wanna set that up and with the board to discuss things. Uh, we'll be taking some public comment tonight. Um, I just want to frame it a little bit before Amy gets going is 
the kind of two areas we're, we're looking for as to, are we going to extend the, the current outdoor dining past August 15th to a later date, possibly the end of the year? It's up for discussion. And then the second part is, what do we want to do for 2022? What portions of outdoor dining do we want to keep, adapt, remove, uh, public benefit? And Amy's, Amy's going to walk us through that. Are there fees that we can charge? Um, the cost benefit analysis for um, just you know visitors, uh, retail downtown, parking, just kind of try to look at the whole picture. Um, so I just want to kind of frame it that way. Uh, so we don't have to decide tonight, but Amy, I think you'll get, you know, Amy and I met on Monday and kind of went over this because it's right. rather complicated on, I think November, we're going to need to know, you know, even into September, kind of where we're going to go with this. So we don't have to have things decided tonight, but a good discussion um, would be great. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And um, yeah, I'll just go over the, the three um, action items here too. I know there's been a lot of conversation in public and online and, and, you know, it's not going to be the end all decision tonight. It's a check-in, obviously a very new program. We want to have a nice check-in in this, in the season, a couple things. One, I'll review the current status, uh, go over the regulations and laws and things that we have to consider. And just a couple action items talking about extending the permits past the current expiration, which is 60 days past the end of that state of emergency, and then getting some direction from the select board, um, on how we move on into the future, what we want to consider, what groups we might put together to discuss further options, things of that sort. So I'll go over those. Um, that's what we'll be looking to do this evening. Just quickly, um, you know, the status of our emergency orders, as we know, uh, the current local approval of dining, outdoor dining permits was till the end of the year or 60 days past the end of the state of emergency, whichever comes first. So that's why we're gonna address that. Um, that date is August the 15th, since we ended, or the governor ended the state of emergency on June the 15th. So that's the current status here. Um, the legislature and the governor signed into as part of the acts of 2021, um, the act codifies and extends several of these um, provisions that were put into place uh, during the pandemic. Uh, this one we're discussing outdoor dining extends until April 1st of 2022, the ability of cities and towns, in this case, a select board to approve requests for expansion of outdoor dining service. Doesn't require you to do it. It gives you that ability to do so without going through the process and having state approval. It gives you the local ability to do so. So they extended that ability until April the 1st, 2022. And just to know April 1st is generally when seasonal licenses kick off. Um, so that is that indication there as well. Um, it also extends your uh, ability to modify the scope of any earlier approvals we have that continues as well. Anything that comes um, up as far as as they they say issues with snow removal, pedestrian traffic, similar concerns, and we've been doing that and I'll review that too as well. It just quickly, in addition, they extended the beer, wine and cocktails to go for on-premise locations. Um, they extended that until May the 1st of 2022. So um, they've just added the um, pricing needs to be the same for on-premise and off-premise consumption of that alcohol, but the uh, conditions they set during the pandemic will continue. So the restaurants will be able to serve, or excuse me, sell um, alcohol to go with food orders only as they did currently. Question for you, Amy, mm -hmm. is there local control there? Could we decide not to do that? I'm you know, not saying that we one's, want to, but. Yeah, and I would, I'm gonna probably refer to, to legal on that as well. That one's probably tougher to do because that is certainly, um, they're allowing that license to serve either way with those certain conditions. That would take probably a lot and definitely a public hearing and vote on that sort of situation if they want to consider. Um, it, it, I mean, it's helpful to their business, but it's causing other problems too um, because you're, it's easier to buy that alcohol with that food and have it immediately as far as open containers and things of that sort. So, but it was certainly a lifeline for a lot of restaurants, I'm sure. Um, but again, if it's something to consider, that would be direction we can take. Okay. 
Um, so I did just a review and I don't have to go over everything, but it provided in the packet for you, um, the terms and conditions of outdoor dining. Certainly if we go through today, what we want to discuss is the select board, um, wanting to extend the current outdoor dining permits with these conditions past August 15th. Uh, the recommendation is until the end of the year. Um, and then I'll go over as well the process between public and private locations, two different processes that we're gonna to have to determine. Um, just basically we have dining service only, um, our closing time and last call at 11 on these spaces. We're not doing entertainment permits for these spaces. Again, it's just additional space for them to have outdoor dining, not to increase your occupancy uh, and things of that sort. So the first thing we'll ask you to do to certainly is to consider that extension. Um, and that would cover public and private spaces. And again, we'll still allow you to make edits or adjustments as we go. Don? Do we wanna jump into discussion? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah, do one at a time. Um, I think it would be very odd to sort of change anything in the middle of August. Um, so I'm completely open to extending it till the end of season. I'm wondering if December 31st with the way our season runs really makes sense or if it should be like Columbus Day. And then we kind of get everything cleaned up before any real bad weather right. starts. Um, but that's just I certainly think we should extend it past August 15th. And then what we do next year is a is a separate. Correct. discussion. And, and, and as far as timing too, I'll tell you what I've, I've been asked. And a lot of, of folks, as we all know, have staffing issues and even the extra spaces is, is hard enough to do a normal, normal thing. So not all will want to continue that long. Some will ask for um, stroll. Obviously they have outdoor heaters and things of that sort and to be able to on stroll weekend and especially Thanksgiving week and weekend tend to be busy too as well. Um, so I know that was a request, but again, you know, at your pleasure, as far as, you know, what you want to consider. Okay. Oh, oh, thank you. Um, I agree um, with your assessment on, oh yeah, microphone, sorry. Um, and um, I, I like the idea of extending it um, through stroll. Um, I think that we're going to see likely a lot of restaurants not even stay open through stroll this year. Um, but for those that do decide to do that, having that flexibility. And I think they're all well-versed in the weather and preparation, so on and so forth. Um, but I'm fully in support and not making any changes until later in the season. Christy. I was just going to make the same comment to provide them the opportunity to go through the end of the year with the understanding that many have staff issues. So they might be closing after Columbus day, um, but at least gives that flexibility. Yep. Uh, Question: If uh, if we were to extend it to say December thirty first, we still can make adapt adaptations if we want to. Like let's work. I'm not picking on anybody, but yeah. we want to open up a certain road because we see it's not used. The restaurants are closed; they're not opening up. We can correct. We can change it as as we need to. Correct, and as as we just went over with the acts of 2021, it gives that you that ability to make those adjustments as you need it. And as you mentioned, we've made several. Mm -hmm. um, based on whether traffic patterns or, or busy locations mm -hmm. and a couple of have brought them down on their own, um, you know, on one side of main street or the whales not doing it. They're using their own patio, um, dunes, not so much out there. So a couple are bringing it down based on need and that sort of thing, but absolutely. And we've made those Cambridge street. We made a, a reduction and uh, lemon press on main street there reduced it a little bit so everyone is just in front of their own stores and locations mm -hmm. um, to make it fair across the board okay yeah don um I, i'm absolutely fine with doing it till the end of the year i would just like it if we could request if say someone wants to close for the whole month of november and then just reopen for stroll that that they break it down during that extended period of not being open right that would yeah, and the request. Correct. Especially in the sidewalk locations. And there's things we have to consider as far as resources needed if we had to take out road closures and things of that sort. So I certainly would request their plans ahead of time so we can make that discussion. Okay. So, yeah. Can we, can we go? I feel like we have a vote coming, but can we go to Roberto Santaria? Um, yeah. <laughs> he has his hand up. Really? His digital hand up. He's not here. Oh, well, hello there. Um, just a quick question. What if the, re the with the Delta variant, the way it's going, 
Um, what if we reinstate the state of emergency? What does that do to all of this? Um, <laughs> the buzzkill, right? Okay, so. <laughs> Uh, love Roberto. That's so usually, that's usually me, Roberto. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> See, on vacation. Um, okay, so that would become from the state, certainly, as far as and certainly locally, if we tended to have an issue, we would we can act. Um, but certainly, we'd want people to be outdoors, um, probably as much as we can, anyway. So um, that will come from Roberto and his friends, and probably state health, as far as if they institute the state of emergency, they're going to have to amend this legislation, you know, cause that's what it, right. it sent. So that's a whole other ball of wax. But again, we're talking about outdoor spaces and that's where we're gonna want people anyway. So, so I think if we were to move this, we had a motion to, to, to extend this to the end of the year, we can make moves any, any way. Right? Absolutely. From, from Don's example to what Roberto brought up, Right. It's not, doesn't beholden us to keep anything as is now. Not at all. It's, okay. you know, and it's administrative task to make sure that we officially do so. And again, when we've done this already in the past two months, you know, we've talked to the location and, and both, both times they've been, you know, very receptive. They've done, you know, what we've asked because of whatever issue. And we always gave them seven days to, you know, work out what they needed to work out. It wasn't like you need to move it tomorrow. So we kind of try to work with folks too, if something comes up, um, and to do that. So that's what I would just ask that we, okay. you know, communicate well. Right. Would the board like to make a motion just on we this part? A few more I points. know. Would the board like to make a motion? I, I'll I, make a motion for discussion to extend the outdoor dining provisions until December 31st. Second. Any discussion? I'd like to hear the public comment before we go to a vote personally. If it's about this extension. Yeah, I'm happy to hold the motion. Okay, let's go to public hearing. Oh, the, 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 uh, let's go to Bart. Uh, you call on me? <laughs> I'm new to this. Can you hear me guys? Yep, yes. go ahead. Hi, uh, Bart and Jimmy, Easy Street fans. Yeah, thanks for hearing me, Chair. Um, I don't want to be the old man on the lawn. Uh, it, it, for those of us who already had outside dining, um, you know, during COVID, of course, couldn't, you know, the, 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 the brunt of it last year, nothing to say. Uh, we all were in the, the, the muck and the mire. Uh, this year, it seems that some, uh, I, I don't know about the occupancy situation, uh, but it seems that some are getting two bites of the pie. Uh, they have the outside dining and then at night or whatever, they have full inside dining. And like for me, I have 50 seats inside, 50 outside. And I don't know, I pay for those seats. Uh, uh, I don't know if we're going to even the playing field in some way. I, again, I, I don't want to be, uh, uh, my fellows need their uh, opportunity to regain their money. But right now, I'm competing against 400 extra or 200 or so extra seats in the downtown area uh, with my patio that I've always had and have paid for. And I, I really am just putting it out there. I don't have a solution. I've looked into asking for a, possibly a, a beer and wine license, but that changes my concept. Uh, just trying to recoup my dollars as well, because now when people look for outside dining, I have a lot of competition. So I'm just putting it out there as an idea of like some of these, some operators are getting a really special deal out of this and i don't begrudge them that but i just also don't i don't know I'm putting it out there am i still on yep. yeah go ahead bart uh, I, I i don't know if that so that's really all i'm saying i don't have an answer or a solution or a proposition uh but as you look to extend it i don't know how you can factor in the impact on others, and especially the fact that the parking also is being reduced. There's some issue, there's some instances that seem a bit uh, aggressive, uh, taking up many parking spaces. They already have outside dining. I don't want to name names, but they already have it, and now they've extended it, and they've made it almost like a outside dining room, and I know there's expense involved, but it doesn't seem fair to some me particularly, but also others. 
like uh, Metal Main and stuff like that, or what is not Metal Main anymore, but you know what I'm trying to say. Uh, established patios that were there aren't really gaining anything. I never even tried because why would I? Where am I going to go with it? Moreover, those that have no patios before now have them, and they also have the benefit of full indoor dining and late night, uh, let's say, clubbing, uh, you know, for those that are bars as well. Thank you, Bart. I just want to remind everybody who's uh, getting ready to speak. We're just talking about extending it for this year and not making any changes unless, unless we need to. Uh, we are going to be talking soon about 2022 and getting into the details. Just want to remind everybody that. And could you please be, uh, try to keep it to at least one minute so we can try to get everybody. Go ahead for Sarah Ellis. Yes. Thank you for taking my comment. Um, as Amy and Matt and probably the rest of you know, um, I have had a serious objection to the congestion that was caused by Lemon Press um, regarding the allowance of people to simply walk down that portion of their sidewalk. Um, I also had an objection in the spring to blocking off Cambridge Street, which I understand the allowance. I understand the fear of the Delta variant coming back and people returning to outdoor dining. But I personally feel as a taxpayer, and I am not the only one, that as much as I would like to support certain industries in Nantucket, um, giving that up to people who have mobility issues, um, other being a former retail person downtown, giving up parking simply for restaurants as opposed to retail establishments um, is, it, it just doesn't behoove you as a board. Um, it's very, um, this summer has been a real something show and I think anything that incorporate, incorporates a modicum of respect to those of us that live here through the end of the year would be more than welcome. Um, I also have to agree with the gentleman, knowing lots of people in the restaurant industry who pay the price of having outdoor seating already and pay the price of having that be weather dependent, their numbers, their capacity numbers based on that number. The fact that apparently our town is subsidizing, and maybe I'm incorrect, subsidizing um, certain restaurants that proclaim themselves to be community oriented, but all those of us on the street know are not. Um, it's just very, um, disappointing. And I also feel that in terms of what Don was saying, I believe it was Don, excuse me if it was not. Um, basically, anytime that they are not doing business, they're, they should be paying for those blockages to come down for all of that work to be done so that there can be access to our state highway, which is the Steamship Authority. And the idea that we would block those for local commerce is upsetting to me in terms of the fact that despite the numbers going onto the ferry this year, there are those of us that need to go off for doctor's appointments and other reasons that are not vacation oriented. And I think it's just very, um, I think it's very ageist. And that's the last I'm going to say. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Jana Forrest. Hi, sorry about that. Um, thanks for taking my question. I just kind of had a question for clarity. I'm wondering if the restaurants that are allowed to have outdoor dining um, under this permit, if they are paying for that extra real estate or if it's um, just uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, gifted by the town under these circumstances. So I just wanted clarity on that. Thank you. 
Janet, they are not paying. And that's something we're going to talk about shortly after this, after we do go through this motion is uh, going forward, mostly in 2022, how do we make it fair? What are some of the fee options that we could look at? It's a great question. Mary Longacre. Thank you. I think it's recognized that and is unequal in this case. The restaurants that are benefiting, you know, it's not every restaurant, as Mr. Ganjimi said, and the public is paying a price. I mean, if you want me to be six feet apart from people outdoors, it's harder to do that when there's a lot of outdoor dining in town. Um, I, I think that uh, I, I would suggest that you extend this through Columbus Day weekend which is you know, the bulk of our season and certainly the, the nice weather. I certainly don't think changing in August is a good practice, but I don't think that extending it without any changes through the end of the year is fair to the public and is fair to the uh, establishments that are not benefiting and in some pla places are uh, being harmed by the extra activity uh, outside their businesses that they're not benefiting from. Um, the other question I have on this is, you mentioned that there's a differentiation between activity on private property and activity on public property. And I think that differentiation needs to be part of the policy now. I wouldn't want you to extend the uh, public access through the end of the year just because you're extending everybody's access. I think it's time to treat those differently. I have no objection to a restaurant having outdoor seating in general and having it on their private property but I think that the public's needs need to be taken into account at this point. Um, and certainly I think uh, Columbus Day weekend would be an appropriate place to stop the blanket approval of all of this. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Any comments from the board? Yeah, Christy. Thank you. And I appreciate all the comments from the public. I think one of my biggest concerns is this, you know, COVID isn't going away and if we go to October 15th and then we're having spikes in November and December, I think we want that opportunity to have outdoor dining. So I think it's better to err on the side of caution and have this available to our community so that they feel safe being able to dine out. And we're doing our due diligence of keeping our community members safe by providing this option. Um, so I think it's worth going to the end of the year. Thank you, Christy. Matt? Just a, just a comment for the public is we've heard a lot of positive uh, in, input from uh, retail from this. The fact that people are, more people are coming down and they're walking around and waiting to be seated has helped all the businesses downtown, not just the restaurants. So it isn't a uh, selective gift, you know, in, in, in large part, it's a way of trying to keep uh, downtown uh, vibrant and keep some economy. Last summer, especially retail, had a really, really tough time in the, in the right. restaurants with alcohol had a really, really tough time. Right. And I think that, you know, they're trying to dig out of what was a tough time and, right. and they're trying to dig out with no employees this year. And, uh, you know, so anything we can do for all of them, we, we, they pay high rents and it's a hard situation, I think, is to our, all of our benefit. Thank you, Matt. Dawn? Um, I, mean, I think we should move the motion forward. I'm still a little, a little bit torn on the timing, but I want to um, see how everyone votes, but I thought maybe we should add something that if anyone's going to be closed for anything more than say five days, that they've got to break down what they what they're set up. And then just one point on that too: um, those locations that have cement barriers or things of that sort, we depending on the time of year and staffing may not be able to pull that up. So in some cases, you might be have some parking open, some possibly not. So just to level set on that, that's tough. Yeah, I'm just kind of thinking yeah. that at that point, if someone wants to close for an extended period and they've got all their indoor seating available, that Correct. maybe they're just making the decision to break it down for the season. And I think, I you know- I, I think it causes a lot of angst when it's sitting there right. with everything in the way and they're not open. Mm -hmm. There's other places, and I looked all over the country as far as who was doing what. And I did say, and this was in California, that they did have a requirement for, you have to be open a minimum of five days or using the space for a minimum. So that's a lot probably I know in certain times of the year, but they did have minimums for that. So if they did, someone did go five days or more without it, that would be a reason to pull it down. Um, so I did see that throughout the country um, because the same reason. I think, I think that's fair. Don. I think saying if you remain open and you're open X days a week, then it remains. But if you're 
going to close. It's it doesn't. I think that's a fair ask. You know, December, you know, October, November, December. It's there's not all. It's you know, it's you're only talking four or five weeks, six yeah. weeks. So. So so Erica, we're going to add that to the motion that he's Matt seconded that. I seconded that. Yeah, I'm fine. What was the uh, time frame? Because I know some. So if they close for five days or more, then they just kind of forfeit it, it and it goes to getting broken. Because a lot of people close that first week or two of November, which is you know, Mid Island and downtown. So that would my, make. My, everybody... Oh, I'm sorry, Jim. Go ahead. My my only concern about that um, is it may limit the flexibility if we do um, see a spike. So I think we have to be prepared to amend that um, if for some reason there is a subsequent state of emergency or even just a community concern without state of emergency. Yeah, I mean, just, just on that, if I may, um, I would imagine if, if that happens, we probably will then be discussing whether there are any events like stroll happening. Mm -hmm. right. So I would think that the, the whole climate would be altered. For sure. Amy, and then Christy. Mm -hmm. Um, certainly in the cases we've had before and anything moving forward, I would report to the select board anything that I saw that was an issue or that that came up that met that to make sure that um, it was agreed that that was the action to take. So it wouldn't be something we would just do and, and not tell you. Certainly we would report it to you if that helps. Christy? I was going to mention, um, I like the idea of adding that if you're closed for five days um, to break things down, but I'm just wondering if that could it could not be like a be all end all. So if you decide to open up later on after a couple of weeks, you could then put things back out. But if you're going to be closed, make sure that you're putting all your tables and chairs inside and not leaving them on the street for six weeks. Can I make a, brief, a little bit of an amendment to the thinking on that, that if it's just putting tables and chairs back out, that's fine. If it's barriers that the town needs to be responsible for moving, we can't be pulling those in and out. Correct. So there are going to be varying situations. Correct. So I would amend my motion yeah, to reflect and I, and that I, if I Matt's think, okay with to yeah, second completely, that. And I think that's what makes sense. The town should be on, on call to bring barriers back and forth for okay. busy weekends. So Right. You know, I'd make, I make I agree with that. All right. So, Erica, could you read back the motion just before we take a vote? Um, the original motion was to extend outdoor dining provision to December thirty first, um, but add to the motion that if anyone closes for five days or more, they need to break down the outside seating. But the caveat that if it's only table and chairs, they can put them back out. But if it requires Jersey barriers or anything else provided by the town, once it's gone, it's gone. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Is that aye, Matt? Sorry. Aye, yep. Yeah. All right. That, that motion carries unanimously. Okay. Now I see people have some hands up. We still have lots mm -hmm. of time to talk about. May All I, the rest oh, of the stuff. Yeah. May sure. I answer um, a question that was brought up? Sure. Um, so um, someone had mentioned the difference between public and private spaces. And what I meant by that, and the difference is that for those on private property, whether it's an extension in their parking lot, you know, say fairgrounds has tables in their parking lot, that's private property, the muse and theirs as well. For those places, if they choose to, um, they want to continue that past, um, they want to continue that past, your extension into 2022, they need to go through the um, alteration of premises um, process that we normally follow. And that's available to them now. We're gonna put that out and try to get them to somewhat make that decision soon because they're gonna have to hit planning and zoning and understand a lot of them have special permits and things that were um, excused for a while to allow this. Not all will be able to continue. So I want them to start that process now. So they understand, and then we're going to have probably a lot of different public hearings, and the state has to deal with 200 towns and all of that. So we're going to start that process for them immediately um, so they can start planning. As far as the public spaces on streets and sidewalks, what we're going to talk about is that we need to have more discussion on that, about what we want to do, locations, things of that sort beyond this, to understand what we're going to allow, what the policy is. 
Um, and there's a couple of different legal things we need to uh, agree on as far as passing of alcohol over public ways, things of that sort. So that will require the town as property owners or whatever, what have you to determine what you want to do with that property. And then at that point in time, which Jason and I have discussed, we you know have April 1st in our head as making sure we have these policies in place. We choose to do that. Those folks that want to have a sidewalk permit or a street permit, even if it's temporary, uh, during the season or seasonal, we'll have to go through that same process. So everyone goes through the same alteration of premises pro uh, process uh, through us and through the state. However, we just have some more work to do on public streets and sidewalks and how we want to continue. If that makes sense, I just wanted to determine everyone would go through those sa that same process. We just need to dis discuss more what we want to do. So. Yeah, do you want to? Oh, that? I didn't know if we were waiting to hear from more of the public. Uh, no, I, I kind of want to get into it here first before we kind of go back to, to, the, to the Okay. To the um, yes, and I'm trying to have, go to the first one. I want to see, I, I'm not seeing where the fees information is. So um, what I wanted to discuss, and we can actually even show the photos if we want to, I have photos of all the spots so we can kind of look at what we're talking about. So as we move forward, obviously we just talked about the different conditions we have. What we're looking to discuss is, um, you know, we're looking at some of these public spaces. What we want to discuss over the next few weeks, few months uh, about this are the options for public street use. Now, this happens in a lot of locations, different sidewalks, things of that sort. Um, there are sidewalk permits in a lot of towns, Cambridge and others and things of that sort. A lot of times they're seasonal. Uh, they can be approved for May through September with whatever the town wishes. It would be a separate um, permit on top of their usual liquor license. Um, but we're going to have to determine uh, locations and the fee structure that we see most often are a couple different things. Uh, a lot of towns will uh, do a square footage per square footage fee, and it's not an extensive amount of money, but uh, charge per location of space oftentimes number of seats um, as well, or a strict permit fee. You know, they do strict permit fees of say 250, 500, that sort of situation for those spots. So that's something that we would present to the board as far as options. Um, but what I think we want to ask the board tonight really is direction um, and how you like us to work as a group, different departments are gonna have to be involved, uh, explore these options and present those to you for how we would move forward. Um, and our goal would be have anything in place, have any public hearings before obviously the spring and let those folks that might be able to have this available to do so by April 1st, if that's something we choose to do. If that makes sense to folks right now. Go ahead, Don. Um, I mean, I, I can say how I'm feeling about the current situation. I think if we are back to sort of baseline COVID is over. Um, I'm, I can't really support any clo street closures or loss of parking spaces going forward. I think that, that that space is just too valuable for traffic circulation. And I mean, we've, I, I believe that the general going rate for an in-town parking space is in the like $200,000 range. Um, so, but I would be open to discussion in some certain locations where the sidewalks are wider and accessibility can be managed to do some kind of sidewalk permits. And I'm certainly very open to places that can do it on their own private property to expand into some outdoor seating. Obviously they've got to manage all of their restrictions through planning board if they have any, or most, most in town has no parking requirements, but out of town, if they, they may have to change their occupancy around to manage the, um, the parking. Um, so that's where I am. I, and we have to make it equitable. Um, we are, I think we have to charge some kind of a license fee. And I'm not sure that people will feel like it's equitable if we're charging like $250 for that kind of real estate. So. Right. Matt? Yeah, I'm, 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 I, I think there's a couple of places where it may be, uh, where I think it's allowable. I think, uh, sort of Oak Street. I don't think that's a huge circulation problem. Uh, the same people used to park there all day long anyway. Uh, you know, and I know the cars because I had a business there uh, at one point. 
uh, and left because there was no turnover. Uh, and then there was all, and so this, and I think sort of North Union, I think some of the other places it, it's, it's not as appropriate. Uh, I think the fairness issue, I, I wonder if anyone, I would look into a percentage of sales. If you're at, uh, you know, if you're at Cisco or somewhere else, you're gonna pay 10%. We're not allowed to charge on alcohol. We could probably charge 12, 14% of sales and have a right to uh, audit the books and, and end it if they play any games. And so I think that something like that could make it fair because then you would be bringing substantial money to the town as opposed to, you know, a thousand dollars, two hundred fifty dollars, you know, and that would also address the fairness issue Bart's talking about. You know, places aren't getting, wouldn't be getting as free a pass as you know as, as other places. So I do think that you know maybe there's a couple places where people, the I think public really loves it, the visitors mm -hmm. really love it. So the question is, how do we? Is there a balance we can have? Uh, the parking needs to be addressed through a parking commission and timed and paid parking. And we need to get there because we've added 330 homes in two years. We added mm -hmm. seven, 800 cars. It's not going to solve our, we're not going to solve those issues by, you know, ignoring them and, and growing the grow in building and growing more, you know, we're going to have to do some things different downtown than we've done. And I hope we, you know, we get there by next year. So. Thank you, Matt. Christy. Thank you. I think this year is a really tough year to base our decision on because everybody's coming out of lockdown and everybody is on the island. And so the gridlock that we're seeing downtown, a lot of people are blaming on outdoor dining. And I think that it's yeah. it's just everybody coming out for the first time in 16 months. Um, so I think it's, it's really hard for me to say, let's not continue this next year because I think next year is actually gonna be the base year where we can see how, it, how this would work. Um, I'm actually opposite of Dawn, and I think the street closures in some areas make more sense than the sidewalks. Um, I think sidewalks, we've heard a lot more complaints of not having the accessibility, um, ADA compliance, things like that, versus some of these streets that, um, you know, have made sure that they have the platforms down over the cobblestones and things that are making it accessible to the community. Um, so I, I'd actually be opposite of Dawn and, and wanting to see more of the street closures. and. Um, I was recently off island in Hyannis and they obviously have a much bigger main street, but they've completely redone. So the, the dining's on the sidewalk and their parking lane is the pedestrian sidewalk and there's Jersey barriers on both sides. And it's very easy to navigate and walk and feel safe. Um, if we have enough time over the next year, I think there's some streets that maybe we could be re-navigating like South Water Street, where you have a pedestrian lane and then you can have outdoor dining on those streets. But I think this is this is the time to start thinking about how do we get creative like other towns. Thank you, Christy. Erica? I just have to say, as always, South Water Street is part of the truck route. We have tractor trailers coming through there every single day. I would caution <laughs> you before you take travel lanes out. Yes. Just an idea, right, Christy? <laughs> I think um, uh, that is what we're asking for direction and ability to go pretty soon. And, you know, just like we had the economic task force that worked together as we we're coming into and out of this situation, put together this group that does work on this to come up with things. And it may not look exactly like it does this year. Um, there's a lot of things out of the pandemic that we got to experiment with that we never would have before. So we have some learnings from that, some good things we might've learned from that too. So I think just taking that opportunity to present to you what some of those ideas are and things to look at. Um, would be great. And with the fee structure and, and Matt, like what you mentioned, I did see that in some, some locations as well. Um, so just to have that opportunity and that's kind of the direction we're looking for from the board. A couple of thoughts. Um, I kind of agree with you, Don, on, uh, on the street closures, um, just assuming there's no COVID um, and the parking spaces. However, or, and I also want to, make sure we're thinking about what do we learn from COVID and kind of re-envisioning downtown. Um, and maybe we do something fun in September and October. We close the streets down. It's not in the summer. Right? There could be something like that. You know, we tried a restaurant week in the sep September. Um, it's more doable, but maybe there's six weeks where after Labor Day, we, we do some form of this. So I just want to make sure we're thinking about 
trying to find the silver linings of COVID. We, so we have proof of concept. We know people like it, visitors like it. Uh, retail benefited from it last year. You know, we did it for a reason. Um, not everybody loves it. We've heard tonight, we've gotten emails. Um, but I, there might be another way to do it that's um, not exactly like this year. I think sometimes to try to be perfectly fair or close to fair, then we end up not doing anything. And so if we can make it a little more equitable, not trying to achieve perfect equity, I think would be, that's maybe a way to do it. Um, and some restaurants don't want the street closers, closures next year. I won't mention any, but some that I talked to is that, no, I won't, if I, if I knew I would have it for 10 years, then I could put $500,000 in and, and redo my kitchen to make sure I, that I could actually expedite out right. to the road efficiently. But it's, it's, you know, it's not easy. Uh, what I've heard is it got us through COVID. We love it. We like it this year. We feel very lucky, but not so maybe we don't want it next year. Um, just like we've seen with Dune and, you know, or the whale, they've not, those are sidewalk examples, but they right. don't, they're not using it. Uh, a lot of those for those same reasons. Those, those are my thoughts. Listen, anything? No. Okay. I can, oh, I, actually, no, I, no, I'm just being, I can tell silly. sometimes when you're thinking. Um, no, I am thinking, um, you know, I, I love the idea of a group and, and I'm not sure if I'm clear on understanding that there is a group formed that's going to be looking at this or is it hypothetical, but um, I love that idea. I love a good task force. Um, and I think it would be important that um, there's some retail business representation on that to make sure that they actually have a voice. Um, and, um, you know, I don't tonight want to set any conditions or limitations on the flexibility of that group. I think it's clear where the benefits are and where the concerns are. And I'd really like to see that group come forward with some proposals to us that say, here's the feedback, here's what we think, um, instead of us sitting here trying to, to create that. Um, I see both sides of closing streets. Um, and um, yet I, you know, and I also see both sides of um, uh, sidewalks and, and making sure, but I think those concerns can be, you know, whiteboarded out and addressed and, um, and the fee structure can. So I, I'd like to suggest that if, if it, it needs a formal request to have a task force that we do that and we get some brighter and better minds who are in this day in and day out, um, giving us the recommendations and suggestions. Okay. If I may respond yeah. absolutely to everything Melissa said, and what I was saying is that um, similar to how we had the economic task force that had folks from retail and restaurant and things of that sort together might be the same group and, and just expand it or something similar. So that was an example. Um, and also just want to stress that it's not just about outdoor dining, be about pedestrian access. And we have some ideas we didn't get to pull off that I'd like to see. Um, but so there's other ideas and it's not just about outdoor dining. And the reason why probably a lot of attention is, is paid to this because liquor laws are such that we have to. Um, we have to have a lot of administration with liquor laws. So that's why the focus seems to be on, you know, we talked about with Bart talking and I have responded to him several times in emails about this too as well is it's liquor laws is what kind of forced this hand. Um, so certainly folks without liquor and things of that sort, if they're able to expand, there's ways to do that through planning and things of that sort on their locations. Um, so I just want to focus, that's why, but we want to talk about all sorts of businesses. If I could just follow up, yeah, yeah. Jason. Yeah. Um, I do want to make sure that we're considering the occupancy concerns. Yeah. And I know that that's a huge enforcement issue. Um, and if um, this expansion requires more enforcement, that that is built in to, that's right. baked into the pie or baked into the cake. Right. Um, because I certainly don't want to reward bad behavior for people oh, who yeah. are pushing occupancy limits. So thank you. Yes, absolutely. Matt? Yeah, just a comment on street closures. You know, first off, I think, uh, Chris, you're saying that it'll go back to normal. I don't think we're going back to normal because of how much we've grown and and that we aren't shrinking next year. Uh, what, we're, what we're experiencing on the island now on Old South Road mm -hmm. and Fairgrounds Road in some of these areas was what the consultants predicted in the 90s during the comp plan. Yeah. And all of us Islanders said, oh, gee whiz, this will never happen. It won't get like that. It won't happen. And it's, it's happening uh, you know, pretty much you know, at 25, 30,000 cars. And they said yeah. we did. 
gridlock. We're hitting it at a lot of times now. Uh, so, you know, so we've had consultants who have warned us about this. Uh, we, I couldn't get them to get this into the report, but I, at the time I said, well, what's going to happen downtown? Right. You know, if we continue doing traditional traffic, you know, uh, solutions, what will happen? He said, well, eventually you'll close one road downtown, probably Federal Street, you know, one or Main Street, and that'll make all the other roads a little busier. And then you'll close another road or two roads. And this has mm -hmm. happened at Aspen, Colorado and different places. You close a couple more roads and then the other ones are even busier. Then you'll have to pick, you know, a truck route, an ingoing route and an outgoing route right. for trucks and taxis and buses. And then everything else is complete gridlock. So you go, that's, they said, that's what, we'll, that is traditionally what happens. That ha that's what happened in Aspen. That's what happens in these other uh, communities that have this sort of, these problems. And so at that point, that's when I said, well, we should be limiting vehicles. So we don't have to do that. We don't want to be like that. That right. didn't come through. But, you know, I think that, you know, we have those projections. They're in the files. You should go and read them because it's frightening. Uh, I advise all my buddies who are looking, all my college buddies looking for housing to go to the slow side of the island, go to out by Cisco, go out to the west end of the island, don't go to this side. Right. And, and, I, and that's based on all the traffic projections from 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so, I, so anyway, for down, so tying this into downtown, we have to realize that some of this is going to happen, I think, anyway. You know, some of it is coming uh, unless we, you know, unless we do find a gondola, unless we figure out how we're going to move people without vehicles, you know. And so, and I'm not sure that we are there yet, vision-wise or, you know or as a community, but we need to be thinking that way. Thank you, Matt. Amy, have you heard <laughs> enough from us? We'll go to the public here in a second. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, okay. I think we yeah, have an initiative and can put that together for you. Uh, question on the task force. I agree yeah. with, with Melissa that that would be great. We, right. We've already done it a couple of different ways. Right. The economic task force could be some of the same players. Yes. Uh, there's, there's a timing issue, right? Like in, in two months, we probably want to re some recommendations. Correct. Right? Correct. For but you to be able to three months. Yeah. It, well, it's going to, it's going to be incremental and I'm actually talking to other Cape towns and things of that sort too, and province town and some other stuff, just so I know kind of what's going on out there. But um, I'm going to get together with some of the folks from that task force because we kind of ended it it, it, we talked about this in the task force mm -hmm. as far as the future and wanting to discuss it. You know, we stopped it because obviously we're in the middle of the summer and crazy and, and, and didn't have any initiative at that point. But I think we have a starting point there um, with those folks and see kind of how we can grow from there, if that sounds so good. By the end of September, beginning of October, we would need some recommendations, just roughly. Yeah, no, uh, just... yeah, at least where we, what we think we need, any sort of resources we need or where we're going, absolutely. I, so we've already started talking about this and what we can, we do. We need to figure out our learnings and things from that and uh, go from there. Okay. okay. I'm sure any of these board members here would be happy to be on the task force. So <laughs> please call on us. Jason, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. What's that? Could, could we just um, email the existing economic task force and ask them if there are members who would like to work with Amy on this so that we're not reinventing the wheel or sort of repurposing an existing group that I think did an excellent job right. um, and would probably, you know, I, if not all of them, most of them would jump on this. Right. Or Maybe. recommend someone in their mm -hmm. industry that exactly. could, could right, assist. There was different industries. There was retail, restaurants. Yeah, there absolutely. Was transportation. Yes. There was yes. a little bit of everything. The chamber, visitor services and yeah, all that sort great, of thing. It was a great group. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, can we go to the attendees? The hands up. We have Bart. Sorry, guys. Uh, Mark and Jimmy again, Easy Street Cantina. Uh, thanks so much to Double Dip here. First of all, I want to thank all you. I know this is a sticky wicket with no good solutions and lots of inequity and lots of problems. And I think you're struggling through it. I think the task force idea is awesome. Um, look at case by case, too, and look at the outside. Regardless of the, uh, the capacities of the dining, the, the parking at this point is significant. Uh, even though a match prediction of <clears throat> gridlock and doom and gloom is very often typical of Matt and his forward thinking, uh, which is what we're probably going to end up with, but we're not there yet. And um, anyway, 
Yeah, just the, the task force has to look at all of it, but you know what? You have an impossible problem with no easy solution. Good luck. Uh, uh, you know, thank you. Thank you, Bart. Next up is Sarah Ellis. Yes, hi. Um, thank you for taking my comment. I just wanted to endlessly beat my drum for the fact that I find almost all of the downtown uh, seating, extraneous seating or extra seating, excuse me, um, to be perhaps by the letter of the law, ADA compliant, but very disingenuous. Um, and Nantucket is a hard place to, downtown Nantucket, excuse me, is a hard place to traverse as somebody with mobility issues. But I am not interested in seeing the whole of downtown like the cobblestones paved I don't believe in that but I do believe in the fact that this is a very young board I know Matt will tell me that he's not young but everybody is young and we have such a wealth of older people in this town and we are so lucky to have them that chair the Rotary Group, that chair the Masons, that chair many other groups. And I don't think they should be inconvenienced by people having cocktails and dinner on the street. I'm also on board with Janet Forrest. I want to know that we are being completely compensated as a taxpaying public for the idea that these people are using literally our streets and sidewalks um, and compensated to the degree that, for instance, the public, uh, not public, but the private spaces by the JC have been auctioned off for $2,000 or whether by the a &P or whatever it's called now, uh, Grand Union, whatever. Um, I just find it to become, it's become a very unfriendly town to older people in this last year. And I accept that as part of the condition of the last year, but looking forward, my parents aren't going to ride a bike into town, chairperson Jason, and they aren't able to. But yet they patronize many restaurants in town. They patronize many non-real estate or bank oriented services, which is like, what, 20 percent. Um, and I, I just think that it's it's sad that you're not more respectful as a board of those that are not able mobility wise. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Amy, is there anything else you'd like to hear from us or discuss just for, for to give you direction? Oh, um, no, I no, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Amy. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know if Christy. No, I'm, I'm hear good. From you. I'll go to okay. Christy. Christy's good. I'm good. Okay. Um, I was just going to say, we received an email today from Rick at Rosencrown with some yes. recommendations that I thought had some really great points to incorporate in the task force. Um, about a consistent look downtown, um, what things like umbrellas might be allowed. So that would be something I would recommend to give you right. um, some guidance. And the other thing is just, this might be more of a question to Libby, but an update on paid parking, because that might also Im impact um, outdoor dining next year, if that's something that we're going to be rolling out. So. Thank you, Christy. Certainly, certainly all those exterior things need to be talked about. And that's why I want, you know, a diverse group there too. So absolutely. I think I'm good. Okay. Are there anything? Yeah, one just, thing we, we did consider yeah. that we know this is, you know, at night when all the restaurants are, you know, and retail are working. And so we'll be doing this again 
we talked about doing something during the, during the day in September when things Correct. somewhat quiet down a little bit. So there'll be more opportunities for everyone to, to speak. Yeah, and, and, share ideas. and certainly in the task force format, like we did during the pandemic, we had specific meetings with each industry, with the you know big zooms, with as you you guys know um, from our dining rooms, uh, with each industry. So we certainly got in that habit. Um, so it won't be just the task force; it will be bringing in you know those groups too as well. So. And if I could just talk about this, having to stare at 20 foot versions of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Can we not do that? <laughs> I'm going to send a body double next week. Anything else? We're good. Any comments? Okay. N nice work, Amy. Thank, Thank you. you. Sure. Okay. Any uh, committee reports from the select board? We're kind of, <laughs> we're doing this early. Christy and then Melissa. Um, I was just going to update, uh, we had an NPEDC meeting this past um, Monday, we're back in person fully, we're not doing um, a hybrid model. Um, and we talked about there's an amazing SBA grant opportunity that was brought to our attention from Karen Maycumber, which came out of um, kind of this economic task force that Amy's talking about, and an opportunity for the town to work with small businesses. Um, so we're putting through a grant with the NPDC kind of being the hub, and then the spokes will be different organizations around the community that would help entrepreneurship um, uh, as we get through COVID and beyond. And the focus is on women-owned businesses and minority-owned businesses, especially English as a second language business owners. Um, so Karen's putting in that application, and I think it's a really great way to see the NPDC kind of take on this economic development branch. Um, and this could bring in upwards of a million dollars to the town over two years. Um, and there's really great ideas around different incubator programs um, that I just think would be a great um, asset to our community. Um, we also reviewed the Sconza area plans. I just want to let the board know we'll be uh, having a public hearing for that in August if anybody wanted to attend that meeting. Um, and we reviewed goals for 2022. Um, last week, I actually misspoke when I was talking to Matt about MPDC and said that we had a carrying capacity study and I meant a build out analysis. Um, so we talked about how that's being funded and moving forward. Um, we also talked about the HPP that we just talked about earlier today and how that's going to be setting housing policies um, for the commission. And we're obviously desperately trying to hire a transportation planner as we've not had one for the past year and a half. And uh, that would be a huge um, benefit for us this upcoming year. Um, and then we talked about continuing with the master plan and um, a discussion around municipal broadband and IT infrastructure is something that we want to keep on the top of our mind. So it's a very productive meeting and just wanted to give an update. Thank you, Christy. Any other comments from board members? Yeah. Um, Melissa? Uh, the Board of Health meeting, um, I guess it was just last week, we had a presentation from Dr. McNabb on the environmental impacts um, of pools um, on in our community. And it was a very interesting presentation. Um, I think that what he concluded with it is that there are a lot of variables that are um, make it challenging to create a scientific study about the possible environmental impacts of pools maybe just on um, not beyond just water and individual pools, but on electric usage um, and um, I'm trying to think of any other utility usages right now, but you know, just essentially what the overall impact is. So it was, it was curious. And I think where we landed was um, giving Roberto a recommendation that this could be an interesting study by WPI students on behalf of the Board of Health to understand um, and perhaps inform what policy, either this policy considerations, this board may want to, to take, um, for example, um, or other policy making boards, for example, um, some communities have policies that if you're going to install a pool, you need to have solar to be able to heat it, um, something like that, that might prevent us or further help us avoid a third cable. So it was a really interesting conversation. I think it was really nascent. It's the very beginning stages. And um, Dr. McNabb really did feel that 
it's too big for one person to take on. And so I'm not sure if there'll be a proposal um, to WPI to take that up. But I do think um, there could be some interesting policy considerations beyond just the select board to consider um, in terms of environmental impact. And I think probably just beyond pools, but of you know some other things that are, are involved in development to help us. Um, I know we're really focused on coastal resiliency and that's a really important part of our environmental um, impact and footprint, but I think there are gonna be other things that we'll wanna consider also. So it was, it was a good start of a conversation. Just wanted to let you all know. Thank you, Melissa. I like that there's a, the Board of Health is getting involved with a different perspective and angle. Just sure. a just a question. Did he uh, did he look into uh, sort of there are communities out on the west coast that have studied the impacts of pools on uh, estuaries and places like that? Did he? And then the other place that's interesting that you wouldn't think about is in the Midwest, even in like Iowa and places, mm -hmm. they have the pools are impacting uh, ponds and rivers, mm -hmm. and there's there's a lot of work done in those places, and they're more mm -hmm. uh, they are much more. Uh, aware of it than we are at this point. Yeah, I, to be honest, you'd have to talk with him to, mm -hmm. to get the details on that. Um, he gave us the very high level overview of his report. And um, I think that um, there were certainly some concerns about, you know, um, you know, emptying of pools and where that water goes and what can, you know, what chemicals are in it. And it's just an interesting um, new perspective. I think we've been as a community so focused on the conversation about pools in relation to development. Um, but I think there's some, some interesting and obvious environmental um, things that we should be aware of. And um, particularly as they may impact, like I said, I think the most compelling thing to me was, you know, the, the possibility of discussing of, um, uh, you know, what's, could we require people to have solar panels to heat their pools? And, um, and that's a, you know, certainly there's some that do gas and some that do electric and, you know, so there's so many variables and it becomes a big Rubik's cube, which seems just great for a WPI student to uh, try to figure out. Any other comments, committee reports, Don? I, I just have to note a couple of things about pools, just because I have a fair amount of experience with them. They do mostly run on propane, but I do lo absolutely love the idea of solar. We would obviously have to work for the with the HDC, who many of them are sitting here tonight, on what kind how that policy would look like um, in terms of placement. Um, and pools are very rarely wholesale emptied. They are. Um, set for the winter and covered with the existing water. And after chlorine, there, there is a lot of information on the amount of time that chlorine sits before you would take water out, so. And, and what, what they do, I can't help myself, sorry. What they'll do is you, you, at certain places, you have to have it tested and then it sits and they come back and test it before they allow you to empty it, even a little bit into the estuaries. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing, a few, and I didn't know this a few years ago, Oh, saltwater pools are better. Saltwater pools are great. Well, saltwater pools are actually creating forever, you know, permanent forever chemicals. You know, so the saltwater pools are, you know, some of those are actually worse. Then, and those communities will not allow those pools to be emptied unless someone brings a truck to empty them, because of the damage it's doing to the, uh, you know, to the shellfish and to the, you know, to the to the, you know. So I think that's the those are the that's the type of detail where you have to get into. I think the it, you know the solar panels are great, but that doesn't address whether the the pollution itself and what is that really doing, you know. And I've yet to see you know a tanker truck driving around empty pools on the island. <laughs> you know, we know where they're going. They're mm -hmm. going to the low point on that property, and it's going into the wetlands. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's happening now. And what we should be looking at is that a good thing or not? What's mm -hmm. the impact? Mm -hmm. So, and there are people that know what the impact is. It's been done before. So I'm glad we're looking at it. I, if I might, Jason, I just want to uh, wrap up by adding that, um, you know, I don't want to misrepresent any of Malcolm's study, um, but I do think it's important that, you know, you all know this conversation is happening at the Board of Health and that there may be some subsequent impact of policy decisions that we might want to consider from an environmental perspective 
it's a little bit of a different angle than we, I think we've been, where we've been focusing. But Malcolm did say, you know, uh, he, he thought he would find a certain outcome and he didn't find that. It, it's a very tricky and, and difficult subject, be, particularly because Don, like you noted, there are so many different variables in pools. Um, um, and I had one other comment, um, if, I, if I could tonight. Um, I, you know, I, I'm um, based on that conversation, the sort of um, thinking about solar panels, I remember at one or two of the HTC appeals that came before us in terms of solar panels, we had encouraged or asked the HTC to look at their um, solar panel policy. I just didn't know if there was any update from about that to us from them. At some point. Not that I know of. Okay, and, and maybe we can ask if, if there's, a, you know, just to, I'd love to understand what the time frame is for that review of that and that discussion, because I think we're going to see more and more applications like we've noted. So I just didn't want to lose focus on that. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. There's no other comments from the board. Move over to the town manager's report. Thank you. First up, we have our chief, chief technology officer, Karen McGonigal. She is going to review a um, update on e-permitting implementation. And while we're getting that ready, I think she's going to um, hopefully show us a little bit of a demo. Um, Karen's team and some others have worked very hard to get this um, up and running. Uh, good evening, uh, Karen McGonigal. Um, I'm just going to give a quick update on our new e-permitting citizen self-service portal. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, as I provided in my last update to the select board, we um, implemented our e-permitting system in Energov in October 2019. So that's been in production for quite some time um, for the sewer department, the health department, um, and the plus departments. Uh, phase two was the citizen self-serve portal, which would allow our customers to um, apply for permits online. And that was originally scheduled for March of 2020, but it was postponed due to COVID. Uh, despite significant challenges in, in time and um, you know, resources, we were able to pull together a kickoff in August of 2020, um, and utilizing all remote sessions with Ty the Tyler Technologies development team. This actually worked out better than the live um, sessions because we were able to schedule around our extremely busy departments um, schedules in order to um, have them participate in the configuration development of the system. We went live in April of 2021. I wanna make sure I don't miss any of my notes. Um, with a select um, group of customer volunteers. Whoops. Now I have to look at the six part version of myself. <laughs> it's a little disconcerting, <laughs> especially when you're staring straight at it. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so we went live in April of 2021 with a group of um, customer volunteers and subsequently the Builders Association um, to try out the system. And it was not publicly available just yet. Since then, um, it has been launched on the town website. It has its own web page, and it can be reached from the permits page and several of the departments. And the public launch is essentially tonight. Uh, tomorrow, our um, public outreach manager, Florencia Rullo, is going to be posting on Instagram, Twitter, and um, uh, submitting press releases to the various media outlets, and then also making an announcement in um, the next um, town um, newsletter. Next slide. So <clears throat> um, to give a brief overview of what the citizen self-service or CSS portal can do is customers can register on their own. They do not need um, the assistance of the technology department to do this. Um, they can submit online permits. 
and they can also pay via credit card if they choose to do so. Uh, I would like to make a note that the, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, manual permitting process that's currently in place will remain the same. Our customers have a choice. They do not have to go to the online portal. They can continue to utilize the paper-based system as always. The departments affected are our building departments, HDC, health and sewer, and um, the department staff, the uh, associated department staff process the permits exactly the same way as in the paper-based system. So there is no change for the behind the scenes processing of the permits. This just gives you a quick overview of what the main CSS webpage looks like. Um, this is the permits page on our on the town website. Um, some of you are probably familiar with it. The CSS portal can be reached uh, by um, directly on the top left navigation bar that's circled at the top or from any of the circled or um, arrowed buttons or um, uh, menu items, which would be the health department, the sewer department, and um, I think buildings in there somewhere. Um, if you click on any of those buttons or menu items on the left side, you'll see the health department um, page on the, on the right side of the screen shows you an example of what that will look like on that web page. And then you would just click on that button that says citizen self-service portal, and it takes you to the CSS page. Thank you. Okay, so this, um, the CSS portal page provides some basic information about the system and at the bottom of the screen highlighted in yellow with red font and those big red arrow, arrows are two very important documents, how to register and how to navigate the system. You click on that button and go into the um, portal itself. No, just go to the next screen. I'm, I've decided it would be a little bit more efficient to show the screenshots rather than actually do a, de a demo of the system um, tonight. Um, it's a little bit quicker. This is the CSS landing page that is available to anybody. In the center of the page is the um, tile for logging in or registering. That's the one that you will use most of the time. You can register for an account, you can log into the system, or you can reset your password on your own if you have forgotten it. Once you've registered to the, um, for the system, you can then uh, move into what's known as the CSS dashboard. This is where you will, as a customer, would apply for permits. They can request an inspection. You can pay an invoice, track the status of the permit. And also the GI, town GIS maps are accessible from the top navigation bar. It's a little bit hard to see for people here in this room, um, but there are also links to um, some of the other department um, web pages for paper-based application forms and information. And we've added a new contact us um, item, which is not on this um, sample that goes directly back to a special help desk email that um, is specifically for the CSS system. So the next slide will show you some helpful links and it is in the packet. So if anybody wants to um, click on these, you may. The top one is the live CSS portal and then the various areas on the town website where you can access the system. Again, there is the special act CSS help email account and this is specifically for the CSS system. It goes to the IT department and if it's a technical issue, um, we take care of it. If it's a non-technical issue, we forward it to the appropriate department. I do wanna, uh, there is one caveat for the select board or any member of the public. If you want to play with the system and see what it's like, please do not create an account in this live system. Contact us and we will um, help you set up an account in the training system, and then you can play to your heart's content without breaking anything. Um, let me make sure I got all of my notes here. I think so. So does anybody have any questions about the system? Yeah, I, I have one. If, uh, if I do three, four permits a year and inspections, 
after it's all complete and paid for and, and approved and gone, does it archive it so I can find it later? It, it remains in your account. Okay, that's great. So that, that's in, helpful. In Instead fact, of, yeah. Yep. Ahead, in fact, um, existing permits from existing customers uh, will be accessible in the CSS portal as well. They automatically show up as long as the email account associated with that internal Energov account is, is the same one. Um, and we have been helping our customers to merge these, um, these accounts so that they can access all of the permits that are in the Energov system. So it stays there in perpetuity, as long as I remember my username as long as, and password. Yep, as long as it's in Energov and it's yeah. associated with you or your business, it will show up in CSS. Okay, yes. great. Board of any comments? Questions? Is it I think I think it looks fabulous. I think this is a really great tool, and um, I think it's going to work so well. I'm excited to have people start using it. So thank you for all your hard work. It looks really user friendly, easy, and great. You're welcome. And it was a long time coming. It's too bad we didn't have it launched prior to COVID, but. It is what it is. And I, I want one last thing. I would like to um, give a special shout out to Molly Sprouse. She has been the mover and the shaker behind the scenes of this entire system and the entire process the whole way. So she has, she has been really awesome. So I'd like to thank her publicly. Thank you, Karen. I agree. It's a long time coming. I remember uh, when I was working in the IT department, this was being talked about like you know researching it and it, it, it's so complicated our systems here are complicated but then you add in the support and it and and building and health and it's it's, it's really complicated so um you know kudos to everybody to molly to you the your team and to all of the departments that participated yes. the um yeah, plus the staff at the departments were they really pulled together during a really difficult time to make this work mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. And thank you again for the hard work of you and your staff. The monthly town management and activity report is in your packet. And I typically go over just some of the highlights of it. We have a number of plans, reports, and studies underway. You most recently um, had a discussion about the Baxter Road long-term planning. I skipped ahead a little bit. Um, we are working on a check-in with the board on your strategic plan for September. We have a meeting scheduled with, the, with some folks in Madiket as to the outcome of a Madiket water quality improvement plan. It's more of a study that was completed just before COVID and we are now getting back to what sewering Madiket would look like with routes and costs. And we're gonna be talking with them about that. Pretty soon, you have a facilities master plan workshop meeting coming up on August 19th. Back to road planning at your meeting on the 14th. That was last week, I guess. Um, you did have an update from our consultants, Arcadis, on that. The next update is tentatively scheduled for the middle of August. And we are continuing to work on our PFAS townwide town -wide assessment. A lot of meetings happening. We've started um, working on our fiscal 23 capital, as the chair noted earlier, as well as budget. We have a pre-prep meeting next week. We have a what, what, I'm, what I'm calling a summer issues team. We meet once a week, once every other week to talk about various summer issues and what can we do about them or bring to the board's attention or make note of for future action. Uh, I've met with the Advisory Committee of Non-Voting Taxpayers. I usually meet with them at least once during the summer. I think some of you may have as well, as well as the Nantucket Community Association. We had the forum earlier this month. And so those are some of the meetings going on. A lot of projects and other things happening. We have talked about what to do about the Harbor Master building bids. And at this point, I think our approach is most likely to seek supplemental funding at the 2022 annual town meeting, at least a re request going through the capital program committee on that. The old fire station reuse offices have been moved in there, as you all know. We are working on follow up with an internal group regarding our island home and the information that we got from our facilitator who held stakeholder and community forums throughout the spring. Another meeting coming up on that internally. We'll be 
think we'll be reporting out to the board pretty soon about that. The solar project at the water company, we recently had a meeting with a neighborhood group and the Nantucket Land Council and the energy coordinator is working on some additional response on that. The board was updated about the police reform bill at your meeting on July 7th and there's a lot of follow up with um, getting that, a lot of the provisions of that implemented. And just ongoing projects here, SBPF and Baxter Road is obviously active. We issued an RFP a couple of months ago for a diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic plan. Those two proposals were received and are in the process of being eva evaluated, and you will be getting that in a uh, pending contract, I think, at your meeting on August 4th, as well as the Jetty's concession. We're working on the scope for a classification and compensation study, and we're working on an update to our committee handbook. Some of us attended a code of conduct Mass Municipal Association workshop a couple of months ago, and we got a lot of good ideas about updating our committee handbook. We, we have had to put a lot of items on hold due to COVID, and uh, including the some of the items that are issued there. We are working hard to get back to some of those. Personnel, as you know, we are in the process of bargaining with all units. As was noted earlier, we are still trying to hire a transportation planner. We have managed to hire uh, a deputy fire chief. It's an internal appointment. Sean Mitchell is our new deputy fire chief. We're glad to welcome him to the management team there. We are still looking for a deputy director of facilities and pending is the position of park and rec director. And that I think, as you all know, is a position that we are in the process of developing a job description for. We have not yet determined what administrative structure that position will fit within, but we are also working on that. And I'm just gonna go ahead and mention one more um, personnel matter. Our DPW director has resigned. He's been talking about um, most recently a move to the private sector. And I'll get you a copy of that later um, tomorrow, it, it came in today. There was a lot going on today, so I didn't really have a chance to get it around to people, um, but that is um, happening. So we wish him all the best. And the deputy DPW director, Stephen Arsenault, will be the interim director moving forward. And I'll be meeting with him on a regular basis about really, you know, day to day and how to tackle the projects that are out there and prioritizing them and that type of thing. So we'll also be talking about um, how to go about a search and things like that. So we thank Rob for his service and the projects that he shepherded through the town. And I think that is about it for the uh, manager's report. I had one question on uh, marijuana license regulations. What What's coming up for us on that? What do we need to consider? In the well, next even this, year or two. This, Was it, go ahead. This, this has really languished a bit. We really ought to have these by now. And they are things like regulating hours and um, types of uh, similar to liquor licenses where you would have, uh, we have liquor license regulations that, that talk about, uh, you know, it's mostly hours, but, but there are other things like noise and perhaps odors for this particular industry. Is there any other like zoning that. considerations of possible you know, co-ops or um, um, say a farm growing something and selling to the dispensary here? You know, those type of considerations that we kind of brushed over in the very beginning. I think there are potential zoning considerations. Those would not be in regulations. They would be in the zoning bylaw. Right. And Which we have to go to town meeting. Yes, so. and I I want to say there are um, there are state requirements or state um, restrictions on uh, some of that. So we would have to be sure that the state allows whatever it is of, of that type of thing that you're referring to. Mm -hmm. I, I can talk to the planning director again about where that stands. I think the um, we were kind of waiting a bit on the cannabis advisory committee yeah. to come forward with some recommendations on that. Um, yeah. Okay. It was just such a, you know, when I was chair last time, it was, I feel like that's all we talked about that year, you know, so it's kind of a refresher on what's coming, what's coming up for that. I mean, Act Natural got their approval and will be opened on Saturday. Yeah. It's like 72 that. hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, any other questions for, for Libby? Comments? All right, moving on to our second public hearing. Um, so we'll open a public hearing and consider the appeal of Lily Pond uh, neighbors of the Historic District Commission approval of a certificate of appropriateness uh, number HTC 2021-04340 for a building relocation for property located at 36B Lily Street. So I just wanna go over just a reminder for, reminder for the board and the public who's here and watching from home. There's a process we have to go through for an appeals procedure uh, for this for the HTC. And so I will open the public hearing. I will ask the appellant to state uh, his or her case. The reason for the appeal, if two people need to do that, that's fine. We can split the time. And then Historic District Commission uh, defines its position. And then I, we can take public comment. Um, usually there's some rebuttal and I wanna be really uh, kind of strict and careful on the rebuttals. Please everyone talk through the chair. Sometimes we've done many of these. Sometimes you can start talking to the HTC or members just kind of just keep the eyes up here and talk through, through me. And uh, if I, I, I'll try not to cut anybody off, um, but I just want to make sure if I start to hear things that are being repeated, I might ask you to just uh, summarize and then ask somebody else to speak. I just want to say that um, out loud. And I would do that for the HTC, not just for the appellants, just to, you keep, I'm sorry. Uh, I think Mr. Riley is going to be on line. Is that correct? Is the council on Yeah, I just asked where council was before we get started. Yeah, I didn't even look up. I assumed uh, Brian Riley was on. Sorry, just wanted to alert you to that. So I heard somebody whispering over here. <laughs> Where's council? Um, sure. Okay. So we just wait a couple. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to have council here because there could be some, you know, details that is going to be outside of our understanding. We'll need some, some of uh, their. Uh, comments on. So we'll go appellant, HTC, rebuttals, open up the public, um, and then uh, just going through the, the pr procedure here, the chair invites questions from the board, closes the public hearing. Sometimes after you close the public hearing, people still like to talk. We try not to after that, um, but we'll try to get everything out before we close the public hearing. And then the board will make a decision, may take the matter under advisement, a written decision is prepared for the board's uh, signature. That's the procedure. Any, any luck over there? Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Brian Riley is here from our town council. Help us out if we need him. Thank you, Brian, for being here. We're just getting started. Okay. Okay, uh, the appellant. Hi there, just please state your name. Hi, I'm Mark Forsyth, year round resident, husband of Suzanne, my wife, and dad of Jack. So thank you for hearing us. Um, I do want to thank the board to hearing this appeal. Uh, why we are appealing, I'll just summarize, but there's also members of the Lily Pond Neighborhood Association, which I'm basically speaking for now, uh, and I'll summarize our points. Um, but there are obviously a lot of other interested parties with this. So the first issue we really had was there was a clear violation of the Roberts rules of order and possibly an apparent uh, conflict of interest. And uh, that was detailed in our cover letter packet to you and is also memorialized on YouTube, um, which I find ironic as a dad, I'm always telling Jack, if you post it, it's there forever. So it's the same with all these town meetings that are now online. So after reviewing that, uh, YouTube meeting, we just realized that in relation to recusing and abstaining of meetings, which is clearly laid out in Robert's Rules of Orders, there, there was definitely a violation. And in fact, there was um, a town manager memo on April 19th of 2019 that was issued that was kind of reminding all the boards and commissions of what those rules were. So we feel that everybody should have played by the rules, but in fact, they're not. So in light of that violation alone, we're simply asking that the you as the select board remand this application back to the HDC so we can have a proper accessible hearing. Um, and I'm happy to go through the 
the detail of what occurred if you didn't get a chance to watch that riveting YouTube video. Mr. Chair, would you like me to go through that in summary or? Sure, if you're gonna go through it, I'd ask other people to not repeat it. So okay. if you wanna go through it, that's, that's, that's fine. So let me set the table here. So by the time the um, applicant, this application came forward, um, Diane Coombs was the chair. One of the members um, of the HDC recused herself because she was a neighbor and was very clear with her position on opposing the project. So she felt compelled that she should not speak uh, or not be on, on that particular um, part of the hearing. And Ray Pohl, who is the chair, also recused himself because he works for the applicant, which in this case is Blue Flag Development. So then Diane Coombs steps in to um, basically chair the meeting. And while we, we the Lily Pond Neighborhood Association had submitted a letter, which is in your packet, which simply asked, you know, before you advance this application, erect height poles, because there's a lot of issues about scaling um, and, and where this project is going to be constructed and to do a site visit. And the reason why we wanted a site visit is because of the visibility of this project. It, it's literally in a fishbowl. It's surrounded on all sides by a view from some public view. Uh, so there's just a kind of a, a nice design in a bad location, shall we say. But we wanted the HGC to see that on their behalf. So as the meeting was progressing, the recused HDC member noticed that no one was there to speak. And we'd all been prepared. We all been discussing our points and we wanted to be heard, but nobody was there. And in fact, she brought this up to the chair and then Ray Pohl interrupted the public hearing and told that HDC member by, by, that she couldn't speak. And there seems to be some issue that uh, this particular member is not in a butter. So she's a member of the neighborhood. So whether or not she could speak as a member of the neighborhood, you know, I think that's a, a legal question. But the fact that Ray, uh, who recused himself, stepped in to uh, draw attention to an order of the meeting, that in fact is Diane's job as the, as the chair. She's the one asked to run the protocol and referee the meeting. So there was that issue. Um, moving on to why we're appealing this, there was definitely some issues around open meeting compliance and also what the public must endure in order just to attend an HDC meeting during COVID. There were a lot of, um, shall we say, meetings that we all had to attend just to wait our turn. <laughs> and I know that's partly because of the high volume that HDC is dealing with, but it's also, a, you know, it's a major burden for the public to monitor websites and attend meetings just to wait to be heard. And I know the burdens on both sides, both sides of the architects and the developers, but also the, the concerned citizen. You know, we do believe that, the, that during COVID, the HDC is doing their absolute best by following open meeting laws. And they're dealing with a record high volume of applications. And we don't believe that this was malicious at all. We just all feel that we're all doing our best to operate during a pandemic and we all deserve some allowances and some flexibility. You know, we, we all relied heavily on the public alert process. So the HDC is saying like, well, look, we'll put it on the website ahead of the time. But I think you all know, we, we were all really dialed into the public alert process and, and there was some gaps in how that was shared with us. And I'm happy to go through the, the, the timeline for you all. But I think the biggest issue is the applications pulled, the abutters are notified, and then it's literally weeks before your hearing comes up. So you have to monitor, you have to attend these meetings, you have to do everything you can if you're concerned. But I think most people give up quite honestly, which, which is why there's so many applications just flying through the HDC. So our, our butters letters were sent on April 8th. Um, the agenda was for new business items is finally posted. We're monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. April goes through on April 21st. 
there was an alert that was linked to an April 29th HDC agenda, and it looked like this topic may be heard. So we all plan to attend. There was no reference to an April 27th HDC meeting, which is the meeting that we're referring to. And there was no, uh, there was no public alert about the HDC meetings between April 21 and April 26. And again, the meeting that is in question was April 27th. So we all felt the meeting was gonna be on the 29th, it was on the agenda. And lo and behold, in reviewing what was posted when, the agenda was posted on a Friday afternoon before the April 27th agenda, which was compliant, quite honestly. But that's not what people are relying on to, to attend and be alerted. So we just feel like during COVID, the public at large is relying on an alert system. And we had no way of knowing the meeting was really happening, you know, unless we're monitoring the website, you know, on a frequent daily basis, which is a burden on the public. You know, there, there is a lot of issues around scale and impact and what this, this project is gonna do to the neighborhood in the historic setting. I don't know, Mr. Chair, if you all wanna put on your, you know, architects and HDC and developers hats and go through that, or if that's something we should reserve for the HDC to weigh in on if this is remanded. to weigh in on right on, now on just like how we feel the scale and impact is going to have this project will have on the surroundings uh, i think whatever you feel is arbitrary and capricious decision by the hdc because that's what we're going to be looking at okay well we feel that we ask for simple things as i said earlier we ask for height poles to be constructed first before the the, the application was advanced and we asked for a site viewing and and as I said, you know, this project's highly visible from all sides. It's in a historic setting. It's next to Lily Pond. It's reliant on, on traversing a public way that's, that's highly used for people to come down Lily Street into Lily Pond. So there's just a lot of issues, none of which was discussed. And the height poles weren't discussed. So we felt, you know, that's, that it felt like it was just rubber stamped through, quite honestly. So now you've got blue flag development being allowed to relocate a historic barn in order to accommodate an inappropriate, inappropriate larger scale home with no concerns to the neighbor, neighborhood, no concerns to the setting. You know, and the, and the proposed structure is simply inappropriate. The uh, last of why we're appealing this, and it really is, I would consider island-wide kind of the whale in the room, if I may, is since Ray, did, Ray Paul did not recuse himself properly, and according to the town's old guideline, he has to leave the meeting. Well, how do you leave a Zoom meeting? I get that, but you have to leave the meeting. And he willfully interjected and influenced the outcomes while his wife and business partner, Lisa Botticelli, presented the very project being discussed. So that, that to me is, is also an issue and something that we're all talking about in the neighborhood. It's, it's simply, you know, whether or not that is a blatant conflict of interest. And I know many people that sit on these boards give a lot of time and a lot of effort. And I get that. And I think that's awesome. But I just think that, you know, it's, it's optically unethical at the very least, and I think a conflict of interest at the very worst. And I don't know if that's something that you all as a board will grapple with, but I do think that State Ethics Commission could potentially grapple with that and may be interested to do that. So having said that, I think my comments are closed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Oh, well, please don't do that. Please, I wanna use a Sarah Alger quote um please don't do that when people clap at town meeting um hcc would you like to um come up and then we'll do a rebuttal both ways and then i'd like to um give a little room for the board to ask some questions and then we could maybe do another rebuttal after that hi, hi. kathy flynn land use specialist um as far as conflict of interest i would think that town council would address that because um, yep. there is a special circumstance we'll ask for hdc yeah. yes yep. 
But um, as far as the meeting is concerned, I posted the agenda as according to open meeting laws. I sent, I responded to Mr. Forsythe's email on the 6th of April. I said that I wouldn't forward the letter just yet because the agendas were so long. And then when the agenda was posted on the 23rd, I went back and I um, told him that I forwarded the emails to the board. I gave him instructions on how to access the meeting on the 6th and the 23rd. Uh, the access to the meeting is on the, on the agenda. Um, it's, I mean, as far as staff is concerned, I put the application on the view pack, but I'm not allowed to ask for hype polls. That's a board decision. Um, the, the letter was posted on the view pack. The letter was read into the record by Holly Backus. Holly and I were monitoring the meeting and we didn't see any, any neighbors other than architects waiting to discuss their future projects. We had our, our, our emails open, nothing was coming through. And I didn't get an email till after they made the second vote for the house and saying they couldn't get <clears throat> into the meeting and they were trying to get through the meeting through YouTube. And I sent uh, an email back saying, this is the instructions that I sent on the 23rd on how to get into the meeting and on the 6th. So I just think there was confusion with the agenda postings and the alert system because the alert system is strictly for um, agenda postings and road closures, job postings. And I think there was a confusion between that and the agenda postings. So I'm here to answer okay. more questions. All right. We can do rebuttals right now or the board can ask some questions. Does it, would the board like to ask Brian Riley, town council? Okay, let's just do that. And then we'll go to, we'll be a chance for rebuttals. Melissa? Uh, I'd love to hear Mr. Riley's opinion on the conflict of interest statement uh, that there was a violation of that. You mean specifically um, the the HEC chair Ray Pohl uh, yes. recusing but staying on but a staying Zoom call, on. wife is helping out that whole yes. issue. Okay. And has Attorney Riley watched the tape? If that's the other question, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I did watch the tape this morning, <clears throat> so I did see uh, you know see what happened in there. Uh, in my opinion, there was there was not a Ryan, violation on. of the conflict Ryan. conflict law. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Don't. Oh, I just wanted to add if if you do think that there was a violation of conflict of interest by any of the parties, is that grounds for us to remand it? Let's see that question. Okay, go I see. Go ahead, Brian. Um, I may as well address that first while I'm thinking of it. Um, <clears throat> you know, I know that the that the board's real. Um, Kind of standard here is to see whether the decision of the HTC is arbitrary and capricious. Um, and in my opinion, if there had been a violation of the conflict law by by one or even two members, um, I, I don't think that in itself makes something arbitrary and capricious. Uh, plus, whether the conflict law has actually been violated or not, I mean, I may have an opinion and I'll, I'll get into that, but um, whether there's been actually been a violation or not, that requires either a finding of the State Ethics Commission or occasionally a court. Um, and so I don't think that itself would give, a, would give grounds uh, for this board to overturn. However, in this case, I don't think there were uh, violations. Um, I have also looked at the, uh, the town manager's memo from a couple of years ago that was referenced, and it does, uh, it correctly quotes the State Ethics Commission's position on recusal, which is you're supposed to, quote unquote, leave the table, which obviously is a little strange when things are happening on Zoom, uh, but you know, you're not supposed to participate in your official capacity. Um, you're not actually required to leave the room, and so the fact that these two members were there, you know, listening, able, were logged in. Uh, that's not a violation. It's a violation if you should have recused and you step in and start acting on the substance of the matter. But, um, but there's actually even more important aspect uh, to this, which makes it not a conflict, in my opinion. Section 17 of the conflict law says that you you can't get paid by a private party concerning a matter in which the town has a direct interest, and you can't act as agent or attorney uh, in such a in such a matter. And so that 
typically prevents a town official from, let's say, appearing before a town board uh, on behalf of a client, or or it even includes uh, neighborhood associations, you know, speaking on behalf of neighborhood association. Um, you're always allowed, even if you have recused yourself and left at the table, you're always allowed to sit in the audience and if you're recognized, speak on your own behalf, you're just not supposed to act on someone else's behalf. But the, the important consideration that I want to I remind the board, and I know I remember, recall this coming up once before, there was a uh, special act of the legislature <clears throat> in 2002, chapter 90 of the act of 2002. And it says that the members of the Nantucket um, HDC are exempt from the provisions of chapter 268A, sections 17A and C. And those are the two uh, sections I just referenced. Um, I've honestly never seen a special act like that applied to a single board, um, but, uh, but it's on the books. And so, you know, that, that tells me that, that really as a matter of law, even if a member did violate section 17 uh, by participating in something that they shouldn't have, um, there, they, it appears that the, that section doesn't even apply to them. So, Bottom line, I, I don't think there was a conflict of interest by either of those members. You know, what they what they said uh, was very brief and really not on the merits of the uh, the uh, application. Um, so in terms of the conflict law, I don't think there were violations and I don't think there are grounds based on that uh, for the select board to act on it. Um, I know the other issue raised was the open meeting law. I don't know if you want me to address that or not. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, uh, again, just briefly, and the, the previous speaker uh, is correct. I, uh, I don't know the ins and outs of this public alert system, uh, but in terms of the open meeting law, the only thing that's required is that the meeting notice with the agenda get posted in the official place, which is the town website, and that matters that are dealt with are listed on that agenda. Uh, the agenda for April 27th for the HDC was extraordinarily long, uh, but it was very detailed and it listed all the properties and applications they were going to deal with. And it was posted more than 48 hours ahead of time, uh, excluding the weekend. So, you know, again, in terms of the open meeting law posting itself, which is all the law requires, uh, that appeared to me to be in compliance. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for... Mr. Riley. Okay. Uh, any other rebuttals from the appellants? Sure. Go ahead. Um, Sarah McLean. I live at Six Skull Island Lane. Not live there, but on the property. Um, and I won't speak to anything about what we've just heard. It was very confusing. I was supposed to be the one who was going to represent the area because I have a fair amount of experience with the HDC. And I was sent to notice that it was on the agenda. I had been on the meeting the previous, uh, I guess the week before, literally waiting for it to come up. And, um, and then they said, oh, it's Thursday. And I was like, great, I'm on for Thursday. And so I missed it. Um, what I will say that hasn't been presented is that one of the other things we really were concerned about is a wetlands determination. And we went and we have spoken to um, the land bank and CONCOM because they both have um, purview over that one because they directly abut and the other because they sort of oversee that. And because of COVID, the permit that was supposed to expire um, was extended um, because of Massachusetts uh, laws. And so any permit was extended throughout the, the um, state of emergency. Um, what we were asking for is that they got another wetlands determination because it's incredibly wet down there. The buildable envelope has shrunk dramatically over the four or five year period of time since they got the original permit. And we did have that in there. We do feel that nobody really said anything about it. And um, I believe it was also in the letter that was presented. And again, the board didn't really take that into consideration. And we feel that's very important to every one of the houses around there. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. I have some questions for Brian, Brian but does the HEC want to, any comments? Let me give them an opportunity on, on what Sarah just said. 
Kathy Flynn, um, real quickly, the HTC doesn't make any determination on conservation commission. It's their strict purview is, are the architects appropriate and what can be seen from a publicly traveled way? That's it, so unfortunately. Thank you. Board of any comments or questions? I, I was just gonna ask Mr. Riley, just the, where, where does uh, wetland determinations come into play with HTC? I, I understand uh, that, I'd like to ask Mr. Riley that. Sure, um, I, I again but would agree with the, the previous speaker. Um, the the HTC has has its you know under its uh, special act and, and bylaw um, has the has its jurisdiction over things. Uh, if there is a wetlands issue, then perhaps the conservation commission may have something to act on. But um, it, as I understand, there is a, a a permit in place, perhaps only due to this uh, you know carryover during the state of emergency. But um, but I, I think whether there is a wetlands problem or not with this project is not something the HDC would look at. Thank you. You know, I've, I've and a lot of these in the past, I think a lot of times uh, select board members have agreed with some of the issues from the appellants. However, we're, we have to decide if it's arbitrary or capricious decision by the HTC. Um, the, this is a public hearing. Is there anybody from the, the public that is on, that is watching this online or here that would also like to speak on this matter? Okay, Matt. I'm not sure that we have to find it arbitrary and capricious to remand it. We could remand it and say, uh, we think that there was the public, you know, we want to err on, we could remand it and say, we want to err on the side of caution that you know that there's a lot going on at the HTC. There's a lot going on uh, because of COVID and you know online, and we'd like to remand it and let the public and the uh, con you know the land bank have their have give their public input on this property. And yeah. I think that would be entirely appropriate. I, I think that we, you know, I don't think that the HTC did anything wrong. The HTC office or staff did anything wrong, but I think there was clearly a misunderstanding. And clearly people who expected to speak didn't have a chance to. And I don't, you know, and I think in fairness, that's not right. Yeah, so I, that's that's my take on it. Yeah, I believe Mr. Forsythe asked for, he's asking for a remand. So what he opened up with. Right. Yeah. Christy? I just have a question for Brian. If we were to say that, um, that there wasn't public access or, you know, notice to the meeting, would that have to go for every decision they made? that night or is it just this one because it's under appeal? Well, um, again, I, I think my best answer to that is that as long as these hearings, um, as long as the notice to the public complied with the open meeting law, I, I don't think there's a problem with them. Um, and as, as far as I know, uh, they, all, they all did. Um, um, was there two parts to your question? Sorry. Nope, that was it. I just didn't know if we would have to have the HDC review all the items. I think there's 50 on their agenda that night. So I see. Yeah. It wasn't proper notice for people to participate. Would this then apply to all 50 of those decisions? Right. Um, in terms of a, of a remand, I actually checked with my colleague, uh, uh, Attorney Pucci, who usually covering these for you. Um, uh, he he said he only recalled a remand where where all the parties agreed to it, all the parties wanted it, and to cure something that happened at the uh, at the hearing. Um, the the um, you know what what there is on the books for the HDC in the town doesn't reference you know what whether the select board can or can't uh, do a remand. I know that when it's a fairly common thing in court cases, again, where all sides uh, want to fix something that happened and they agree to a remand. Um, so I don't know what the applicant's position on this would be. Um, but, uh, but again, it doesn't really, you know, the, the bylaw or the act doesn't specify one way or the other um, on the subject of remands. Mark, I'm sorry, Matt and then Don. Yeah, just my, mine isn't just make a finding that there that it was mine is that there was a misunderstanding and let and, and 
remand it to straighten that out. And so anyway, I'm not saying we make a finding that it was improperly posted because clearly it wasn't, you know, by the strict letter of the law, but by the sort of by the you know, sort of the smell test, it sounds like there was a real misunderstanding and they missed. And, and it wasn't just the neighbors, it was uh, land bank sent us a letter as well. And so, so that's why I would like to think that, you know, maybe there's more to be discussed and that maybe both parties would say, geez, let's go do that. But Can I just, yeah, my question was, is there anybody here who's representing the applicant to discuss it? Christy? Uh, just to follow up on Matt's question, uh, if the technology didn't work to notify, you know, the land bank and the um, neighbors to come, then that's why I'm asking. It's everything on that agenda, nobody was notified about. And that was a glitch in the IT, not on anything that the staff did wrong. Um, but it's, I didn't know if there was any other issues that came up that night um, that would have to be relooked at. Or if it would just be this, because this is under appeal. It's my understanding it would just be this. Uh, but but I, I don't know if it was a glitch. I think we, that's what our, how our system works, right? We don't have a great system, but it's, but open meeting law wasn't violated, correct? I think that's a good clarification on. Is, is it okay if I, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, yes, I'm sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, I, on April 6th, Mr. Forsythe sent me a letter. I sent the department a letter. I gave them instructions on how to access the meeting, it was very brief. Then when I forwarded the letter to the commission and I responded back to Mr. Forsythe's, I copied the link to the agenda and gave him instructions on how to access the agenda. On April 26th, he emailed me back. I don't think he read the email underneath and it's on, I have it in the packet. Um, I, I don't think he read it. And I, like I said, I think he was just relying on the alert system, which is unfortunate. But, um, but, but I did explain how to get into the meeting twice. Um, but yeah. Sure. Okay. Go ahead, yes, please. Yeah. Suzanne Forsyth, 8 Bull Island, Island Lane. I just, I wanna repeat that we truly just want to be heard. Um, and we are asking for courtesy because of COVID and all of the data coming into our homes at that time, um, online banking, online schooling, online work um, and we we feel the HDC didn't give us a fair review. Okay, thank you. Does the uh, board have any questions? Well, I'm just, I am trying to understand exactly what, what specifically needs to be reheard that's in regard to the exterior architectural visible from a public way features. Um, because the, the CONCOM piece is an entirely separate issue that is completely under their purview. Um, I think Holly maybe wants to say something. I just, okay. I don't want to belabor something that. Holly, go Mr. ahead. Mr. We'll Chair, go Holly Backus, preservation planner for the town. Um, as Kathy had um, made a comment, I read their letter into the record for the commission, and I do that at those particular moments. It's up to obviously the commission to take those comments, suggestions, what have you from the public. Again, it's more of a, um, just a request, what have you. But I think as, as Don, you, you obviously know, it's just because somebody asked for that to be done doesn't necessarily mean that's something that's going to be done. Um, so I just wanted to make that point for, the, for you all. Thank you. Sarah, Suzanne. Sorry, Sarah McLean again. Um, as far as the HCC issues, I didn't know that I was going to talk about them again. But from the standpoint of we've been at this for over three years with this applicant in terms of the different things that they're trying to put on there. And originally it was two sites. It was a massive house. They ended up selling one of the lots off. Things have changed dramatically. What they're trying to do now is um, move a historic structure the little barn that they, you know, the whole, it's gutted, the whole bottom has been sitting there. It was a, a giant hole with water in it for a year and a half. Um, they want to take that, put it onto the back of the property. It will be viewed from Gull Island, Westchester, Lily Pond, 
and it'll be five feet off the property line. So you're gonna see two sides of that building from all of the different public ways around there. It's not something that should be there. Um, and then they're putting a massive house with a gambrel roof to maximize their space, which is where we were coming into the concom because we think that the building envelope that they're currently trying to present is too big, which I know now that concom has nothing to do with you. Um, but we, all of us in the area feel that it just is not appropriate for this site. And so to Suzanne's point, we just want to go back to the HCC and actually talk about all of these things and be there and, um, you know, sort of present what we want. The applicant has, has presented so many different iterations of this over time. And as a neighborhood, we have been so understanding for such a long time and living with what they have done in terms of allowing things to deteriorate and then tearing them down because they said they can't be you know fixed um and i'm surprised that they're not here frankly so anyway that's the historic background of the site it's it's not appropriate for this site and we would like to go back to hdc and make that very clear thank you i, I think i said like i said before we all may agree with you on on that may or may not, but we have, we have to look at the 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 decision of the HCC it was arbitrary or capricious, or do we want to remand it? Um, does anybody have any thoughts? Before I ask anybody else, I want to try to wrap this up here in the next five or ten minutes. Can I make a comment? Yep, yep, sure. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Val Oliver. I'm on the HDC, and I sat on that application. A couple of things I want to point out: we have a subcommittee called the Historic Structures Board. And I think it's important to note that they didn't have a problem with moving this barn. The barn is existing. We are elated that the barn is going to stay there. So because it's moving on site is really not concerning to us because there was evidence shown to us on different Sanborn maps that this particular structure has moved on this site down in this area several times. So we're keeping a structure. As far as the new building, yet nobody was there to make any comments. That is not an arbitrary and capricious moment for us. So if I would appreciate if you're going to remand it, that the arbitrary and capricious part is left out and it is simply has to do with COVID, IT, whatever. Just revisiting it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Suzanne, did you have another comment? Did you have another comment? Yeah. I would just say that it's been years of smaller agricultural buildings on this site. And by allowing them to move this small barn, it allows for this much larger scale structure, which is not appropriate for the lot. Everyone says a gambrel is a two story in disguise. Um, and then separate from that, I would say that at the meeting, I, I'm still not clear why Abby Camp was not allowed to speak when recused member Ray Pohl stopped her from speaking when he was supposed to be recused. Why was it that um, Mrs. Coombs didn't take that on? Yeah. I'm just confused. Yeah, I don't know. We don't know that either. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think, how does the board feel about closing public hearing? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kristen. Just a clarification question. So there was two different applications in front of the HDC, one to move the barn and one for the new structure. Only one was appealed. So if we're sending it back, we're sending both back. So just we're just talking about the move on the move of the barn. Correct. Um, in their original letter, the appellants mentioned the new house, but the appeal wasn't submitted properly. So that couldn't be considered. And it had already expired the time that you're allowed to uh, submit an appeal. So the only thing you consider is just the barn being moved on its own as its own application. Thank you for clarifying. We can talk about this and you know keep it open, or we can close it, talk, and then make a decision. I think we've heard we've heard from, from everybody a lot. Let's uh, close the public hearing. I don't see anybody with their hand up on the attendees. Any last comments or questions for Brian or a motion? Um, I mean, I, I would just say that I feel we have the purview to remand for two reasons. One is 
a true procedural error. Um, and the other is for an arbitrary and capricious decision. I mean, I found that the record was pretty thorough with the, the um, all of the evidence that was presented and with the testimony that was given by the um, HDC representatives. And um, I'm, ju I'm just not seeing any real evidence of any kind of an arbitrary and capricious decision. It sounds like the review was pretty thorough and appropriate. Okay. Regardless of my, you know, con concern for people feeling like they weren't heard, um, I think they followed the correct procedures. Okay. Thank you, Don. Anybody else, Melissa? Uh, I tend to agree with Don. I think the notice is um, arguably confusing, but I think the HTC and the staff did everything that they could to do that and. Um, it is, I think you said earlier when we were talking about the e-permitting, um, you know, the systems aren't perfect and um, it does require a lot of um, commitment and time from citizens to, to you know, uh, keep your finger on the pulse of things. And I understand that that's frustrating, but I, I don't um, see enough evidence that it was done so improperly that um, it would justify asking HGC to remand it back to them. Thank you, Melissa. Christy or Matt? Uh, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I just, I would like to err on the side of caution. I'm, you know, I'd like, I think I'd like to give the public a chance to be heard and, and they feel passionately they've been dealing with this for three years, you know, moving the building. We, we made a bit of a mess of the other side of Lily Vaughn, but the, you know, the neighbors went to court and won. And, you know, and so, you know, there's, so, so moving a building may not be so simple if it ends up, if it ends up being a court case. And so, you know, so I look at this from that angle of saying, how would I like to be treated if I were in that situation? You know, and I, and I would, and I, I think some of it is, some of this sounds like a bureaucratic answer. Like we did the, we did everything we had to do. We did the letter of the law, we did it. And, I, and sometimes I think the answer is, well, you know what, we should go a little further than that. So, you know, so I feel like that's, you know, in this case, and I, and I don't think that the HDC did anything wrong. I'm not saying, and I'm not saying the decision, you know, we can't, we, we aren't supposed to substitute our, uh, our view of it anyway. So talking about whether we like how it looks like or not, we can't do that anyhow. So, you know, so I'm really just basing on the fact that it sounds like there was an honest glitch. And I'm also based on the fact that I think the HDC is overwhelmed. You know, if you try to follow some of this, they have 50, 100 applications. You know, how are you going to follow that? If you're the public or you're even an employee, how are you going to follow? You, you wait. I've, have, I've had complaints from architects who've waited months, and then it just gets passed over and they wait again. I think that this, they really, I think that has to, that has, is so frustrating to everybody. It's frustrating to the architects. It's frustrating to the board. It's frustrating to the you know, people who are trying to comment, you know, so I, for, for those reasons, I'm very comfortable remanding it. I, I agree with the, what's being said. I don't think that the HDC did anything wrong in this case. I think it was COVID and access when you read through the emails and they were trying to get in, they're trying to get in through the YouTube, which again, was one of the original ways that we did it. So I can understand a lot of the confusion as things changed. Um, and so I, I'd be comfortable giving this back to the HDC. You know, they don't need to change their decision, but at least give the option for the neighborhood to be heard, um, given that there was that glitch and that they weren't able to attend the meeting. Okay, thank you. I have a uh, question for Mr. Riley. Uh, can you give us some direction on a, a remand? Do we have enough justification to remand? Just to go off what you said, Don, is it uh, it's procedural error, error or it's arbitrary and capricious? I think we've all agreed and said, but I've heard you say it's not arbitrary or capricious. Um, how, how does a remand work? You know, can we do it with what, what you've heard tonight? Um, well, I don't want to tell the board what to do, certainly. But, um, you know, you. I think that either the board would need to find that the decision, something about the decision was arbitrary and capricious, or that um, 
you know, per, a some sort of procedural mistake um, uh, was was done. Um, now, if this was not posted properly under the open meeting law, that at least arguably uh, would be a, a justification there, uh, probably a pretty good one. Um, but, uh, you know, again, based on the information I saw anyway, the open meeting law itself was was um, complied with. Uh, I certainly understand looking at the agenda that was hard to follow everything this commission was having to deal with. Um, but. Uh, and and it wasn't a you know a, a, the whatever the technol technological glitch was was not you know the the HDC hearing did not go down so nobody could you know listen to it I mean the you know the recording is there and and it went forward just for whatever reason some people weren't able to uh, you know to to get into it but um, I you know the, the board can make a call here but uh, but I. Th it does not seem to me as though the legal justification for uh, a remand or disapproving the decision is is really there. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Riley. Other one more question. Uh, you you said something to the fact of you know the applicant has to agree to it as well. An applicant's not here tonight. Is that yeah? A well, as I say, I don't I don't really know how the board's handled remands before. Um, um, Typically, when we see remands in a court case, a lot of land use cases, it happens where both sides say, let's go back down to the permitting board and, you know, fix something and make everybody happy. Um, rather than, you know, one one party trying to get the court to, uh, you know, to send it back. That's not really the way it goes. Um, so that's why I say it's a remand typically is where both parties want to go down and fix something that happened at the hearing below. Okay, thank you. I uh, wasn't asking you to make our decision for us, just to kind of <laughs> what, what we can and can't do with the remand. Right. Any other uh, thoughts? Yeah, on the board? I'm, Don? I, I'm just struggling a little bit because there, just with the chain of events is that there was proper notice given, that the, the abutters notices are in the packet. There was correspondence. There was a letter from the abutters read into the record. There was a separate review by the Historic Structures Advisory Board. So they just, they were pretty thorough in the entire procedure. And then I would also kind of question, I mean, do we, it doesn't sound like there would actually be a different outcome if we were to send it back and you're kind of creating um, a slip, slippery slope of a precedent. Um, okay. That's my concern. Although I do feel for the neighbors. Sorry, I've closed the public hearing. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, the other question I, st I sort of do have is, you know, I guess this is for the attorney Riley. Is uh, was there any? Is there any issue? Because you've seen the tape. Is there any issue with uh, Abby Camp being asked not to speak? Is that something that you know was a was that appropriate? Was that done by the appropriate person? And does that uh, you know does that is that does that put the uh, you know is there is that put the town at any issue if we end up in court over this? Does that give us any liability? Uh, it, in my opinion, no. I, I mean, the I think that the suggestion that was made to her that it would not be appropriate for her to participate or you know to speak on behalf of the neighborhood group um, that is for certainly for any other board. Uh, that is right in the conflict law. You're not supposed to speak for a group when you're a member of that board. Um, you know, there may be a technicality where that doesn't apply to uh, to this particular uh, commission, but um, uh, but no, I, I I don't think so. I mean, the uh, the the this uh, you know the the neighborhood group and some others had uh, you know submitted their concerns before the hearing. So, you know, the commission had already seen those. Um, if the neighborhood group had, had been able to be there at the meeting and the chair recognized them, you know, they could have addressed things further. But, uh, but I, I don't see that this was, um, 
I don't think I don't see that anything on that on that subject that the commission did anything wrong or any or any of its members. Thank you, Brian. Any other thoughts? So I want to make a motion. Um, I'll make a motion to deny the appeal. Is there a second? Could you repeat the motion, Todd? Yep. I'll make a motion to deny the appeal. I'll second that. Any more discussion? Yeah, I, I think I'm kind of torn too because part of me is, well, you know, just uphold the appeal, deny the appeal, uphold the HDC, and if they feel strongly, then this does what it does and it goes through the process, you know, and maybe if it's not going to change, you know, and I feel, un and I don't feel comfortable that the applicant isn't here. You know, the other option would be to, you know, to move this to, you know, say, okay, let's continue this and get the applicant here and see if they both agree to remand. I doubt that that will happen. I don't think we can do it now that the public hearing is closed unless we re-advertise. Exactly. So, and I doubt, so I don't, so I'm, I'm so I'm torn on this as well. I, I agree. There's compelling arguments on both sides, um, but I I don't personally feel that there's enough justification to to remand it back to the HDC, and that's why I seconded the motion. Oh, Erica. I just wanted to note that there's no requirement for the applicant to attend these hearings. Thank you. Are you ready for a vote? Yep. So all those in favor of Don's motion to to uphold the, what did you, how did you word it? To It's to deny the appeal. It to upholds to the, the HDC's decision. For the denial of the appeal. And they can take it to the next level. Right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Okay. So no, that uh, the, the uh, appeal was denied four to one. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your comments and being civil. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for sitting for this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Riley. We're all set. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank just you, Brian. to note, I wasn't asking that the um that like the, the applicant had to be here. Just if they were here, we could have had that discussion. Right. Yeah. Right. No, I agree. I agree with that. And and I'm torn. I I could have gone the other way, but I didn't. Partly because I you know if this goes further, I want it to be seen that this wasn't a clear yeah. cut. Could you guys? You know, this isn't a clear cut situation in my mind. Right. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Okay. Um, any last comments on that? We're all good. Okay. I guess that is it for tonight. Is there a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. <laughs> Second. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. 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 That motion carries. Aye. Thank you. Eric, anything for us to sign tonight? <laughs>